hey, hey, hey. Welcome back. What's welcome poppin'? back. Welcome back. What's um, I have a, we have a technical class tonight. We'll discuss some technical issues and and have a technical discussion. Um, first, let me say for those of you out there, most of our crew's not here today because almost all of our crew's on vacation or on another project, which is absolutely weird. So Daniel's on vacation. Uh, the wonderful Marquita, she's also on vacation. Um, uh, we tried to get Ashley to recruit Ashley at the last minute, but Ashley was doing a fashion show, so she's not here to be on a working station. I don't know. She just walked in and said, what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> um, so at the end of the day, um, we didn't get – we just weren't with a, a thin crew here, so uh, we want to thank the uh, powerful uh, Josh for showing up and supporting us and Jasadi's up front. So these two individuals who uh, who are running the whole show tonight, so – Running really thin, but I think uh, they've taken a lot of precaution to make sure we can give the best possible show with the least amount of resources. So I just want to say to you guys, thank you. Thank you, Josh. Yep. Uh, two, um, I forgot that, you know, last week I wanted to say thank you to Cassandra. Cassandra made a huge donation to the Hope Foundation. And I want to say thank you very, very, thank very, you, very Cassandra. much, Cassandra. Um, um, uh, just, you know, the, the, we're going to... We're going to enhance the retreat. I'm, I'm looking to hire a full-time chef for our retreat to make sure when we do this retreat, it's a very um, pleasurable space. And then in addition to that, we're still working on the goal of, of creating a separate space for the HOPE program. So, um, and just let you guys know that no money that we received is, um, we were very um, financially conscious, right? Because to us, the most important thing is to grow this program, grow, grow our communities, um, and kind of take a different angle on social justice, which is make those who consider themselves um, oppressed have the power to free themselves, right? And I think that's one of the beautiful things about, about, not, about um, being an entrepreneur is it's empowering, right? It's empowering to, to define your destiny. And that's like we talked about last couple of weeks ago, you know, we really don't have problems. We have situations. But we turn them into problems because of our mindset. And if nothing else, even if you don't fully take the absolute journey, this class will empower you to take control of your life, right? Because you'll realize a lot of the loss that you gain is really mental. It's not the reality, right? Death is only real loss to us. We lose. We, we're, the game is over, right? Um, well, for the most part, you can keep the game going. Here you go, Brian. But the reality is that, um, you know, by taking this class, hopefully you understand life is really what we make it, right? This life could be amazing. This life could be crappy. But that's really more up to you than the outside world. Um, we have no idea how bad the outside world can be and how good the outside world can be. The full contrast is out there, right? I was just listening to a story where in India there's a certain group of people where, the, there, where the, there was a tax if you had a little girl. So the women would have babies, and if they were a little girl, they would, they would work together to kill the baby once the baby was born. Like, I don't know anything worse than that, right? Or... Um, there was a woman who was Mayan from Guatemala, and they came to her town. It says, this is, these are serial stories. Uh, they wanted to recruit her husband and her two sons, and they took off from running. They hid. They didn't tell the mother where they were going because they, the, they didn't think the mother, they thought maybe the mother would show she was lying, and they would kill the mother. So they didn't tell the mother. So the soldiers came, like, where did, where, where your, where's your husband? She said, I don't know. So they, so they started killing all of her animals on the farm. And then when they finished all the animals, they started to kill all of her kids. And they made her watch everything. Then they cut her breasts off. Right? Those, like, when you think about a story like that, you realize how bad things are can be in certain places in this world. And then we're at home complaining that, um, um, you know, my TV's not acting right or my Internet's down or um, I didn't get this opportunity I was looking for. And so once you realize the contrast of how much <coughs> variation there really is in the world, a lot of these issues we have, I call the first world issues that we complain about, once we get our mind in the right place, 
we realize a lot of these, a lot of our complaints and problems we have, it's really our projection and our perception is not real. Um, hey, well, I don't, go ahead, go ahead. It, it absolutely is true. And I had a conversation with somebody about that, uh, something similar earlier this week. And it really, it really kind of, t it, it, it it didn't irritate me, but it ticked me off a little bit, and I and I was like, I want to share this, and and that's um, in men in talking business with somebody who p potentially wanted to build a business, and they they not doing good financially, struggling, um, and they're a young youngster. I'm we're talking exchange. I'm giving philosophies about business, and so he, he said, but isn't that corny? Wow, wow. Um, so I'm like, let's talk about it. Like, you know, in his mind that he had a certain reputation to live up to. So there's some things he couldn't do because it crossed the line in, of cool and was in corny land. So I'm like, shit, I'm sure you're not the only one that reflects this same kind of philosophy and mentality. Us as black folks, we do got a lot. Sometimes we have this frame of how we want to look while we're doing certain things. And if it's corny to us, then fuck it. Some people will rather be broke and cool than well off or wealthy or rich or financially secure and be perceived as corny. So hard work, um, soliciting business, um, being grateful, looking at things from a certain perspective, like we just talked about, like um, seeing things within the frame of where you are versus how bad things could be. Like, you, this ain't the Fonz, you know what I'm saying? Like, and a lot of times we think we can become successful and be the Fonz at the same time. Fonz for young people being hella cool. Because uh, I didn't realize, like, oh, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, 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 hey, man, that's, 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 I think that's the first time you've ever did that. I don't think you've ever, I'm an OG, stated, too. yeah, I'm yeah, an OG you, too. you, you usually own all the new stuff. <laughs> that was the first time ever. I was like, wait a minute. So, for those of you, the Fonz was a cool <laughs> person from Happy Days, cool white boy, yeah, yeah, cool Fonz. white cat, yeah, everything he did was cool, cool, knocked on uh, the thing, yeah, man. yeah, that just, god, wow, wait, hey, that's that, yeah, that's. <laughs> Hey, that's a cool memory you brought back, though. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, shit, I appreciate that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I'm going to do it on a, on a retreat, and maybe we'll have a chance to do a little bit with the class. On a retreat, we're going to work through the, the – the, you know, changes. they have this new equation they've been working on for change. And when we do the equation of a change, one of the, one of the parts of the equation is, is a combination of different emotions that have come together for a human being to change. And one of the key things that a human being has to experience for change is they have to be willing. And I think that people might think, oh, I can be willing. No. When we dive deeper into what it is, what, it, what, does, it mean, what does it mean to be willing to change, you'll realize most people are not willing to change. And it's, and it's not a bad thing. Part of what we're trying to get you to is to, you know, before we can help you, you got to love yourself. This class cannot help you if you don't love yourself. Like, you gotta, and I'm not talking about love the future you or who you're gonna become, love the great moments in your life when you won your championships, but I'm talking about you love yourself and all of your perceived flaws. If you can love yourself and perceive flaws, that's the beginning of change, right? But if you, if, but if you don't love yourself, you will always, sabotage your personal change. And like that's, like no matter, and so that's one of the things we're gonna do on this retreat is help people, one, love themselves, two, face the pains they avoid. Because part of change requires for you to face pain. And so we're gonna help people on this retreat face the pains that they try to avoid all the time. They try to talk around, they try to, they try to dress up, they try to uh, distract themselves, right? Like a lot of times the reason people do drink or drugs multiple women, um, always changing hobbies, always changing habits, can't stay focused on anything, they're running from pain, right? And so we're gonna help you kind of stop and realize that pain is part of the ingredients for change. If you can't accept your pains, and by you avoiding your pains, you're also avoiding what's gonna help you change. 
if you human beings don't change if we're hella comfortable. Like that's one of the things about like social social justice I hate is we're trying to design all the discomforts out of individual lives, especially individuals who are suffering from depression. Because a lot of people are screaming racism and sexism, homophobia, and all this. Other. A lot of them are suffering from depression. You know, we, it, it's not popular to say, but it is what the fuck it is. If you study depression and you study the characteristics of depression, it's it's the it's the tone of the anger, right? It's the tone of the communication, the tone of conversations. Um. And so a lot of us suffer from, from this level of depression and what can help us evolve out of the depression is dealing with some of the friction. The friction is actually part of the ingredients that gets us out of our depression. But social justice engineers all the friction away, which is what you need to get up out of the hole. And so we're gonna get into the, like, the equation of, of how to change because I think a lot of people are sitting in class and they're hearing these great lessons and they're, they're becoming inspired. And hopefully we're in broadening your vision because that's, that's also part of the change is you have to have a very, very rich vision. Where do you want to go? Not those vision get-togethers that people have and create the vision board. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm going way deeper than that. But, you know, like, for example, if you sit down and say, why am I here? And what do I want to, what do I want to achieve in this lifetime? And what really matters to me? I think we talked about that in uh, your aim, your business aim. We talked about that last week. Um, these are necessary ingredients for change. And so um, the retreat, we're going to really dive into it because we're going to help you start running for yourself. Many of you guys, I think, you guys have mastered the art of avoiding yourself, right? And, and you almost feel as if you do address yourself, you're going to die, right? I mean, we've seen mm -hmm. it at... Retreats where people have had nervous breakdowns and had convulsions and had extreme crying. And, it, and it's all okay. None of it is wrong. But that shows you how powerful the brain is when it tells you about that, that discomfort of facing yourself. And so we're going to, on a retreat, the goal is to really take some time and help folks get past that. And then last, I think it's also important to understand that to maintain as you start to change, you cannot maintain change if you go back to your old environments. Because the old environment is not, wasn't designed by God, and it just is what it is. The old environment is a manifestation of your work. So you can't go back to your, you can't hang out in your depression to escape your depression. You can't hang out in your poverty to escape your poverty. You can't hang out in your fears to escape your fears. You're going to have to recreate a new world to sit in. And it doesn't mean a lot of people. It could be two or three people. Right? And we'll discuss, you know, different processes on how to build those communities. But that's what Hope is also trying to engineer for everybody is a community of people that you can sit with so you can move on to whatever this new change you want to experience. But it's, it's we don't realize how, you know, you can't, you ever seen, you know, I ran a drug program back in the days and a lot of individuals would come off a crack but then they'll go hang out with their old friends, and within a month or two, they're back. You just can't do that. And, 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 the reality, and we're, not, we're not saying that you have to, like, if you see them on the streets, you don't talk to them. It doesn't mean that you're not, you mean towards them. It's not like they called you for some help. You can't send them some help. But you can't go sit in that environment again. Like, I have family members who I grew up with. Like, all my family, most of my family members on my mother's side are hood dudes. I'm talking about real, like, everybody's done more than six or seven years. Everybody. And I went and hung out with them a couple weeks ago. And, you know, that's fun. It was fun to me. But I, I can't stay there because I'm too far removed from it. But, but, I, it, but when I was sitting with them, just like when you said happy days, and I, it reminded me of me being a youngster watching television in a world that there was a lot of joy built into that world. So a smile came across my face. But when I went to go see my cousins, the same smile came across my face. But I know if I was in that world long enough, it would take me a lot longer, maybe years. But if I was in that world long enough, I would slowly gravitate towards some of those means because those means are built into my whole, that's how I was raised. So I don't return back to that world. And I, and I realize that I'm so disconnected from that world that 
even in my innocence, I have, a t I, have, I have the possibilities of offending them. I can easily offend them because things I will say, this, this seems natural to me, that's because of my evolution, may come off to them as being belittled or being devalued or separation or me looking down on something they're doing, even though I'm not even aware of what they're doing. Yeah. And so it's just one of those things where you guys have to understand that this change thing is not just a, it's not a decision. Change is not a decision. Change is not a decision. Change is a process. Yep. And if you don't respect the process, you don't change. Just like last week we talked about this is not the thing. When you engage, the rhythm of it creates it being the thing. Same thing. If you want to change, it's not, the, the real change is the rhythm of the new frequency you own. It's the rhythm that you're on. So if you don't, you can change, but if you don't change your rhythm, you're going to change back. And whatever, to whatever rhythm you was on before is going to be the output of what you get. I was watching um, because on, on Amazon Prime, I had my son with me. And on, and on Amazon Prime, uh, Good Times popped up in, a, in another show. Um, forget, it was another old school show. So I'm like, hey, this is the stuff we used to watch. This is, I used to come home and watch this every day, 227 and Good Times, right? come home and watch these shows and the nostalgia in my head about those shows and the vibration I was on as a kid was much different than as soon as I popped it on all excited about to watch good times I got depressed as fuck <laughs> because a I realized <laughs> that's, that's, so real. that's the life I was living that's so at real. the time I was a good times kid and I was, I, it didn't make me depressed watching it. I was just watching on the screen the shit that looked like my house. And then when, when I'm sitting in my couch in my house watching it, I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, I literally almost start crying watching it. Episode one, season one. And I'm like, what a motherfucking difference a vibrational frequency makes. Huge. You, Huge. You know what I'm saying? Huge. And if I, so I'm like, I'm not watching no more of these shows because if I watch it, continuously then uh, like he said you the input if you, whatever you input in your brain is so powerful like you know i, I don't know if anybody watching has ha, ever had diabetes or some sort of di um disease where they had to watch sugar intake and in everything to where if they didn't things would spike and they could die like you you need to treat what you input your brain the same way ain't no different it's just it has such a larger capacity and the ability to store shit and hide shit and black out and do all these things that but it's still fucking you up. Yeah. Two things. One, Cassandra, we said thank you earlier. We saw your donation and we want to say thank you personally. Thank you, you were on your way, so you probably missed it. So we want to just say to you, I because Cassandra, by the way, happened to walk in the studio. She came in with her, with her paparazzi here, her crew. They let her, you know, they stopped at the door, they all outside, security. So we just want to say thank you, Cassandra, <laughs> for showing up for Fire TV. We deeply, deeply, deeply appreciate it. Um, and trust me, um, you guys will see the investments we make um, in this program. Um, like all the proceeds that go to Fight Team Media is dedicated towards growing something that will have huge impact on our community, but from an angle that's different than what's popular. Um, second of all, let me announce something real quick. We have a special guest in the house. Oh, yeah, you didn't think I was going to call her out. She should know. Hey. Yeah, Veronica from Veronica. Long Island came down. She's rocking with us. So if she's down online, don't y'all get sad or depressed. She's actually in the house rocking with us. Let me, uh, let me shout introduce out. Introduce her product. Yeah, give a shout out to her product because. I, I, I don't roll my R's. Crema, 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 yeah. <laughs> crema. Calm <laughs> face and body balm <laughs> is the bomb. That's all I can do. I, but I did have a, some criticism. She needs. She has some anti-aging cream, but she needs to make some anti-asshole cream for Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Once she makes that, she's going to sell out. <laughs> No, hey, no, this is really nice. For, I mean, it's ha nice to have her in the house with us. Uh, hopefully, she at some point, she'll ask some questions on the microphone. So um, we, we might have to push her to get on the microphone because we're actually honored to have her out here. So, yo, thanks for rocking with us, Veronica. Yep. Um, uh, other thing, too, is just, just a side note. I can't give you guys all the details because it's a project we're working on. Um, there's a new version of COVID coming out, not the Delta version. Or what's it, the 
uh, you know, which one? The Delta variant. Um, there's a new one, and they're, they're, the numbers are still being crunched. So that's how there's, there's there's no public announcement of it. But if you if you haven't if you receive the vi if you receive the vaccine, the chances of you catching this virus, you, it's a 45 percent chance you can catch this virus the vac the COVID, but you won't go to the hospital. The high rate of people going to the hospital for this new variant is really really high. So um, two things I just want to tell you folks. Um, you know, if, you, if you're if on the fence, let me just tip you over the other side of the fence. Those of you down on the fence, hey, may God be with you, but those of you on the fence, I'm just trying to, I'm going to nudge you a little bit and say, hey, um, I take, I got this shot about six months ago, and um, I ain't got no new zits on my face. So, so far, it looks pretty goddamn good. Two, um, I can almost promise you that your fear is driven by, your discomfort is driven by the fear that was given to you before. The vaccine means that when your brain reaches a point of uncertainty, uh, it creates um, mental illusions. But if you're not going to get the shot, I want everybody to survive that's, that's in the range of my voice. That means start working out. Start eating well. Um, and when I say that, it's because um, if you're eating well and you're working out, you might have an episode, but you'll get through it. But if you're not taking care of yourself, you're not eating well, um, and when I say eating well, go look. It, your perception is a motherfucker. Perception is a cold animal. Go home. And I usually never tell anybody this. Go stand on the scale. If the scale ain't where you think you are, <laughs> first of all, that's the first warning. Two, go take a short jog. If you feel like you got to die after you get past the fifth house, that's another warning, right? Um, analyze. Do a do a do a journal of your whole day. If most of your day is sitting down, you're in, tr you're in a good, you're not in a good space. Uh, I know these things sound crazy, but exercise, eat, as, eat the best you can, you know, space out your junk food. You know, I'm not, I'm not here to try to police anybody or wag a finger. I'm asking, I'm just saying this in need of that. I want to see everybody that's trying to be a part of a solution in the world to be here. And so just take care of yourself, eat well, uh, try to keep your stress under control because high levels of stress and high levels of fear will weaken your immune systems. And so, um, you know, uh, just be smart. Be smart, y'all. And here's the thing, you can't run from a virus. So don't, don't think you can lock yourself in a house and that's all it's gonna be. Viruses is a cold animal and it just takes, you know, it's, it's, it just takes one contact. It's not no special kind. It's not like you gotta go touch the, the, the homeless guy on the corner, and then now that's the only way you're gonna get it. It could be the innocent kid who, who's walking down the street, and he's like, "Hey, go with your mother." And, and before you, I mean, not that easy, but it could be simple, pretty, pretty easy. Um, you could be in a place where the air is circulating some kind of way. So just, you know, I know how you guys have the I don't trust and I don't believe and it's the other, and I get it and I'm with you, but we're also in a world where if we didn't have vaccines, most of us would be here right now. We don't realize how vaccinated we are. When you, you didn't even come out to the hospital without a certain amount of vaccines. And some of y'all got tetanus shots and all kind of other shit up in you. And now we were, and that's old school technology. And so this new school technology, which is supposed to be the next uh, vaccine solution 2.0, which is teaching your body how to fight the vaccine without putting the uh, virus in your body. I don't know about you guys, but you should be excited about this new step in medical solutions because is training your body to fight. Because that's really why you fight off most colds and most viruses, diseases. Your body's already doing no damn work. So we can amplify what it's already doing. That's better than putting foreign, uh, foreign substances in your body and telling your body good luck. Um, so yeah, so, so just, I want to put that out there real quick. Um, that's my, perfect, my public service announcement, my PSA, but uh, I don't do too many of those. But listen about this new virus, it's going to, because already people, Hospitals are seeing these huge surges because when they open up the economy, what they pretty much said, even though they would, no one would ever admit they said this, which is we can we can only suppress money for so long before we have real big big problems. So we got to have the money going. We have to have the economy going. But in that case, we're gonna give you all this window to get shots and your vaccine. Well, after that window's gone, may God bless you. That's pretty much how it's been. But the problem with that, that'd be cool. But a lot of our people. Are, most poor people are uncomfortable with the vaccine because 
why are most people, more people uncomfortable with vaccine? It's because powerlessness changes your reality. When you don't have, the way you see the world is totally different than when you have. And so the, when people don't have, most of people who don't have are saying, no, I'm not taking the vaccine. And so that means that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a bloodbath amongst people, people who are poor. And so I'm really concerned about people who are poor in this case because we're doing the work behind the scenes and we're seeing the numbers and we're watching how the game is being played and we're like, oh shit, it's kind of cold-blooded. And so it ain't all of America in the game no more. Now it's a discussion of the poor and the fundamentalists are going to suffer. And so I just, now, cool, if you don't want to take the vaccine, I'm not, that's not, that's not this kind of conversation because I don't want to make you feel bad about not taking the vaccine. But what I do want to say is, let's not act like COVID doesn't exist. And let's not run around like, yo, I'm invincible. Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. All right? And if you're not going to take the vaccine, stop, stop acting like you John Wayne out of here. Rock your mask when you go and hang out with the crowd. Uh, most of the people who are getting sick are the youngsters, between 30 and 40, I think 42. It's because once the economy opened back up, they had the money to go out and hang out together. And now it's just... It's hitting fast. And so this new variant, if it does hit, and I'll let you guys know once they get closer to making a public announcement, um, if that one hits, uh, either get the shot or just be just take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. All right. With that being said, um, one other small point I want to make real quick. Um, something in our community that um, me and Shakira has been working on, and we still got to work on it, and it's something that is so popular in our community, but it's not, it's not in the slide. We're going to move fast on slides. The first set of slides are going to be very technical tonight. But it's going to be technical on, like, you know, the question is, how do you start a business? How do you build a business? All right, it's going to be very technical because we're going to, we're going to go through the, the step by step by step. Now, this is in the book. We're going to move fast because it's in the book. But all I'm, the goal of tonight is to kind of go through these pieces and then, and then describe some pitfalls and some insight on some of these things, but to move quickly, because I want you guys to know that this step, this step by step by step by step by step, this is building a business where if you do it opposite from this or you let these, these steps go, then you're building self-employment. It's a diff big difference. This is being an entrepreneur, the other one is self-employment. But let me say this real quick. Something me and Shakir have committed to working on, and we come from families like this, and I'm sure if, if you... Um, of, any, if you black, Asian, um, Mexican, uh, poor white, um, Latina, Latina, you will, you will know that this is part of poor culture, which is we sit around, we talk about what's wrong with the world, right? Like, oh, you know what's wrong with these people? You know what's wrong with that? You know what's wrong with the government? You know what's wrong with politics? You know what's wrong with Republicans? You know what's wrong with Democrats? Um, there's a show on HBO, Bill Maher, that's all about what's wrong with the world, right? It's not a solution focus. It's, ah, ah, oh shit, oh my God, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? Every entrepreneur that's hearing my voice right now, let's train go by. Practice learning what you like about culture, people, and opposites. Commit to learning to see value in the opposites. Let me say why. Let me say it again. Don't focus on what's wrong. That's, I, I'll get to that later on in the year, why that's a horrible mindset. But it's something you have to practice. Practice seeing what works. In my studies of like looking at different global evolutions from, from um, nothing to something, developing as nations, the, the plight to come out of poverty, the enhancement of society, the enrichment of society, one of the worst things you can ever do, and one of the things that causes the people to be stuck is that people are often stuck because they fall down this rabbit hole of what's wrong. And guess what happens when you use your brain to figure out what's focus on what's wrong? That's all you can see. You can't see anything else. There's no innovation. You can test it for yourself. Innovation comes from 
first focus on what works. And from what works, ideas sprout and branches develop. And before you know it, you build something that's very powerful. The reason some of you guys lack creativity, because you, you kind of have this, this apathetic type of, this is wrong, this is wrong, I wish this, you know, I'm tired of this, I'm sick of this, I'm fed of this, this is what's wrong with the black community. Like, you can't help a community unless you see what's right with them. It's the same rule with yourself. You can't help yourself until you see what's good about yourself. If everything is wrong about yourself, the chances of you <laughs> evolving yourself is close to none. You have to focus on what you like, what is possible. Also, things you, people you disagree with, you got to learn to see the value in the opposites. I know this is not, this is very, mm -hmm. this is not our culture. Mm -hmm. This is not our fucking culture. <clears throat> but if you're talking about becoming somebody who's going to impact the world by what you build, you got to learn how to see outside of your own personal limitations. And your limitations are showing up when you're having conversations all day long about what's wrong with this group of people, what's wrong with that group of people, as opposed to like, hey, I wonder why they did that. What do you think would be their motivation? That's fine. Discovery, exploration, curiosity. Those are cool, right? Even... Hey, I'm going to ask, next time I'm around, you know, like I, I said, I think I said a couple classes ago, most of the super pro black people I know never talk to white people, never talk to white people. <laughs> like, you tell me all this stuff that white people plan, all the conspiracies, have you ever just talked to them? No. Crazy shit, right? And it's like, at a, some point, start learning to listen to a wider range and conversations of people, and then see what you like about other people. My fascination with, like, for example, I'm not crazy about this um, Asian hate movement, right? Because I think it's being drummed up. More, than, I think it's being amplified by, um, by. Uh, I think there's dislikes, but the the deep hate that they're trying to drive this movement towards, like this is big hate movement. I think it's 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 being misinterpreted. However, so it frustrates me sometimes when I hear some of the people who take opportunities to, oh my God, this is Asian hate. I'm like, oh, I'm like really? Is that what they're really Asian hate? However, watch this. But what I do do is I look at, okay, what, what is the oppression that the Asian community is dealing with? What are the unfairness? And what do I like about the Asian culture? Because it's a big-ass list of shit I like about the Asian culture. Right? That allows me now to, to also see things I could never see before. It allows me to see myself in ways I can see myself before. And the world becomes, you know, when I was a kid, we lived in, I lived in Fruitvale District in Oakland. And Fruitvale District used to be, I would call the fruit tree district. There was a fruit tree everywhere. So I don't remember eating a lot of candy in the summer because we had fruits, plum trees, kumquats, um, fucking um, uh, nectarines, peaches. We had everything you could think of just in our neighborhood, right? And so when I would walk outside, of, walk outside the house, every day was an adventure to go figure out where's a new tree I haven't discovered and what variation of a uh, pluot or a plum tree that I haven't tried yet, right? When you practice what I'm suggesting to you guys by shifting from what's wrong with the world to what do you like about certain things in the world, the world starts to turn into that, that same type of neighborhood for you. And all of a sudden you start saying, no, nah, I have so many ideas, and so many, and you become this solution-based animal is because the way you change the way you see the world. Mm. And also, you know how there's certain nuances and unspoken uh, idiosyncrasies in the black community that outside communities sometimes try to mimic or understand, but they don't get, and we clown them for that. Or we like, see, that's why you need to shut the fuck up, you know? Or it, whatever community um, racially you're in, that's like, we're that to other communities. So understand that too. We don't like, we, whatever community we're in, we know that we know the shit that's going on, spoken and unspoken in our community. There's blind spots in our understanding of other communities. That's why it takes empathy. Even white folks, Asians, like next, whoever, we don't know what, what the sensitivities are. And we, we don't, we weren't there and we're not that culture. That's why it's good to understand from an empathetic perspective um, 
where people come from and have the conversation. What's up? Like, why? What do you need? What's going on? Why do you feel that way? Because there may be some deeper truths or some historic shit or shit that was hidden from history that we don't even fucking know about. Yeah. And then yeah. we're like, oh, shit, they, the government did that to y'all? Like, yeah, like, my, I got cousins with three arms, and, you know, you just never read about it in a book. Like, oh, man, fuck them, you know? So, damn. So, that's, that's what makes... To me, entrepreneurship dope because it expands your awareness and it and it slows you down. We, this right and wrong culture, it guys are so fucked up to, towards each other, towards ourselves and our perfectionism, to, and towards other businesses and how we run our business. Allow shit, allow things to change your programming. Allow engagement with people to change your programming. Our fear of rejection is, it like, that's a lot of times where we go wrong as business folk is our fear of rejection. We don't like to hear criticism. We don't like to hear no. And and there's guilt within ourselves because we talk about other people so bad that we're afraid to make mistakes because internally we feel like they, people are going to do us the same way. And that's how we frozen. We got to break that. Like, I see this shit so much. And, it's, and we're brilliant. Like, it's brilliant people around here. Brilliant, smart, talented folks around us, and it's just those limitations that got us that, that got us fucking stuck. All right, so um, this okay. So here's, here's the thing: for those in the house, uh, we didn't sign anybody to the chair. If you guys have a question at any point as we start to flow in this, just jump in that chair right there with the light on it, and 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 ask a question. All right. Charlize, that doesn't mean you sit in a chair all night. You just got to share with other people, okay? I just want you to know because I know you. Anyway, so with that being said, we're going to jump into this real quick. And the e-myth, we're going to move fast. Um, but once again, it's in the book. Make notes. You can even pull out your book if you wish. Or you can just kind of take write down certain things that are, will trigger your memory. But, or just come back and rewatch the class. But this here, like you took this class to learn how to build a business. Okay, the rubber's hitting the road now. Like we've pr we've been priming you, which is all everything we teach you is part of running a business. Business running a business is not just doing one two one two one two. It's like one th one through a thousand, and they all apply at different times, right? <laughs> and so it's just it's a lot more complex. It's an illusion if you think it's just somebody gonna give you an orientation. You sit down at a desk, and then you just keep working really really hard. You get really really fast. And you get a, then you get a raise for being the fastest. That's just not how it works. And so. Um, we're going to jump into this. Uh, the most magnificent, wonderful Shibisha is going to actually uh, start to read the, the first passage. So we were going to welcome the most wonderful, fabulous, magnificent Shibisha to the mic. Doom, 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 doom. <laughs> okay. All organizations are hierarchical. At each level, people serve under those above them. So an organization is therefore a structured institution. If it is not structured, it is a mob. Mobs do not get things done, they destroy things. So real fast, everybody understands structure. But if your business lacks structure, you have a mob. And trust me, Cor can tell you as well, I can tell you, when the money comes in, you can turn into a mob that fast. Because you should start saying, hey, you take care of this, I take care of this. You jump on this, I jump on that. Okay, you just, just and before we know it, we're just, we're just like two Tasmanian devils just trying to cause, move stuff out of our way, but don't realize we start stepping on each other's toes, we start breaking stuff, we start missing things. So for example, I'd be like, well, I thought it was you supposed to lift the wallet. And I was like, well, he's like, I thought you were going to lift the wallet. And then, mm -hmm. like, well, who's going to lift the wallet next week? Well, I try to get to a deck. And I try, when you say I try, the words I try really means I want credit for something I don't plan on doing. And so you, you'll say, well, I'll try to get to it next week. And eventually, no one gets it done. And so then all, these, then all of a sudden, the business starts to look really like a hell of things are missing, although we're working really, really hard. And that often comes because you don't have structure. Or you'll find people who have your employees a high level of frustration because they really don't know what the fuck they're doing and what this got to do with where the fuck we going, right? And so structure... Without structure, 
you, bec you become a prisoner of your own business. Because you're working hard to get very little done because you're poorly utilizing the talent and skills you have on the floor. Mm -hmm. Next. When the floors need cleaning, when the windows need washing, when the shop needs opening or closing, when the customers need tending, who's accountable for producing the results? So let me go back to that mm -hmm. point. 5T Media is fixing something very similar to this. So trash should be taken out. Well, who, who? I didn't know it was my responsibility. I didn't know it was your responsibility, right? Or if certain things happen around the office and things break down, I'm like, well, how come this wasn't managed? Oh, I didn't know that was my responsibility. If that's not clear, it goes all the way down to accounting, customer service, product production, product quality, product delivery, marketing. Everything will be damaged by no structure. Mm -hmm. Structure, without structure, there's no accountability. Without no accountability, quite often things don't get done. So that means that you are a very intelligent person. This is in the book. You mean the best. You're working really, really hard. But at the end of the day, nothing got, a lot of things did not get done. And you have, you, have you ever been with somebody, dating somebody, and they didn't, do, they didn't do two or three things you asked? And you're like, what were you doing all day long? I mean, my God, you've been at the house all day. How come you just didn't get that done? That's how human beings would view your business. You'll miss two or three things. They'd be like, that dude don't even care about his business. They won't see all the things you did do. And the market doesn't care about the things you did do. All they know is they how they weren't served. All right, this is important. Keep going. What Jack and Mary don't understand is that without an organization chart, everything hinges on luck and good feelings, on the personalities of the people and the goodwill they share. Hey, that's why in, in, in hierarchy, ideas are the lowest on the totem pole. Ideas are the lowest. And that's why the, they stole my idea. They stole my, shut the fuck up. Because ideas come a dime a dozen. Creating a structure, the ability to create and, recipro and, re and re reciprocate a structure continuously to where you can generate money on a regular basis is way more powerful than an idea. So that's why these are super important, and it's not the fun shit. It's not the fun shit that everybody, everybody likes dreaming and coming up with ideas. Like, hey, what if I did, and what if we did this, and how about this? That's cool, but the, the, tr the true skill set comes in the ability to chunk each idea into a, into a structured priority list and attach owners to it so that it could get done on a continuous basis. So this is going to show you why organization chart is very, 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 very fucking powerful. I mean, you guys seen the organizational chart inside of the company and thought it was just so you could be clear on who's, who's the next person you complain to is when shit go unfair with your, your peers and who do you go to if that supervisor fucks up and who's the head of the company, and when they walk in the room, who's the person you don't speak to a certain kind of way to walk in the room? That's a poor understanding of, understanding of an organizational chart. The purpose of an organizational chart is to help you manage yourself into having a business where you're just a shareholder. Two, if you don't have an organizational chart and you're running your business as a mob, one of the things it says here is that it hinges on luck and good feelings, on the personalities and the people. That means that your business only runs well if everybody in there are almost like you. But the reality of that is that that's not good business. You can't hire, that's like, if, if a team cannot afford to hire uh, a LeBron James, Kevin Durant, uh, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, and um, Giannis as one team right now, you can't afford it. You can't afford it. So when you build your team, you gotta build your team with people you can and cannot afford. Sometimes you need to be able to build your team with the lowest possible labor. So if you're building a team with the lowest possible labor, if you don't have structure, then that means automatically uh, good feelings, I mean, excuse me, uh, personalities are, 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 are their, their skill level, it's automatically going to be compromised. Now, feelings. So if everybody's feeling good, because let's say as a supervisor, you may, like as, a, as an entrepreneur, you're making calls every day. And if everybody feels good about your calls, they're working hard. Let's say the next day you come in, you're like, yo, we're going to cut this because of blah, blah, blah. And it makes them feel bad. Now the office and the business runs like shit because you don't have anybody to say, hey, I expect you to hit this number here. This is your expectation. If it's based upon, let's just get this job done. 
Well, the level of engagement will change based upon the mood of the office. Now, could you imagine? Now, moves go, if anybody ever worked in an office, moves are always up and down. So the way you maintain a consistent output is by having structure. Structure helps you override that, right? And then also, a lot of times, it's just fucking luck. You just happen to be doing the right stuff and everything's just happened to work. Don't think that you can build on that lucky-ass system. Mm -hmm. So mind you, this is where the organization chart is the beginning of starting a business. Now, a lot of you guys are thinking organization chart is just me. That's fine. We're aware of that. Organization chart is an idea of planning, and as you plan, you plan what does it take to get a job done. What per Even though you may have to put yourself in every box, you understand the hierarchy of that box. Once you understand the hierarchy of what's at the top, what's at the middle, and what's at the bottom level of getting this job done, you know exactly how to hire in, how to develop that process, and how to move forward. Let's keep going. Next one is. Unfortunately, personalities, good feelings, goodwill, and luck aren't the only ingredients of a successful organization. Alone, they are the recipe for chaos and disaster. Organization needs something more. In my first company that I started in 2000 to 2007, I didn't know shit about organizational charts. I, I just needed help in certain departments. You this, you that, you that, you that, you that. And the company got traction, got traction. Still didn't understand. I'm trying to just piece together with whatever little corporate knowledge that I had from working in the corporate world. And I was doing a shitty job from that perspective. What ended up happening, because this fucking describes it completely, is that 20% of the people in the company was doing 80% of the work. And, then, and so, I, and the work was getting done it was getting done, but I also didn't understand the pulse, the feelings, the energy, because then the 20% start getting resentful that the 80% was just kicking it and feasting on the success of the company at the club. So soon that 20% start going bad. So that mob mentality is real, and if there isn't, isn't real clear expectation of who does what, and accountability for each position. You don't even know the positions. There's no accountability. Then you can you can collapse just like that company did. And my lawyers and mentors tried to warn me, like, Court, this is a shit show. Like, how y'all got this far is fucking amazing, but this is a shit show. You got to put your foot down. And I'm like, I can't. That's my homie. Like, he beat people up for me in, in elementary school. Like, this, like, it was all homies. Cordell. And, and so I'm like, I, I didn't know what to do. But, but if you want your company, you better, you got to learn. We just next part. Go ahead. This is all, this, this is, this stuff is technical and go back. I'm, if you're trying to build anything or you want to build anything or you think about building something, read this chapter over and over and over until you can almost repeat every word. Cause this is step by step building a business. This is so accurate. It's ridiculous. Go ahead. Next one. The first thing they decide to do is to think about the business as a corporation rather than as a partnership. So real quick, two things. Before you develop a, a so-called partnership, rule number one, if the person you're partnering with doesn't bring a separate value than what you bring to the company, then they're probably not going to be a good partner. I just say this again. The person you partner, they, they don't bring a separate value. What I've seen people do is they build partnerships based upon similar interests. We can all love a certain item doesn't mean we should be in partnership. A partner should be a, con just like when you date, you don't want, well, even gay people, gay straight men, gay men don't date a perfect copy of themselves. We always date a compliment to ourselves, right? Because a perfect copy of ourselves will create friction, right? Or nor do you just date an attractive person who has no value to you. Because it's cool the first night or two but as you guys start to make investments in life and build together, you'll start to see a huge, especially when a child arrives, it's just going to be the worst because you're going to be trying to give values and this person might just want to play. And you're like, what the hell? But that's your fault because you didn't realize that partnership does require, uh, it is a process of thought. Now, once you form the partnership, now get out of the mindset of calling yourself a partnership. This is the beginning of not seeing your business as a job, but seeing your business as a business and say, um, we're forming a corporation. And the reason you want to say you're forming a corporation because that allows you to think of it as a system now. 
and a life. A corporation is a life. It's a subjective life you're trying to build. Where if you're trying to build a partnership, that language automatically makes you start to focus on personal, um, your person. It activates your ego to project your ego into the world, project you into the world. So you per it almost starts the process of personalizing everything you do in your business. And that means when I try to give you feedback or if you do something wrong, it's going to be cutting you every time. But if you see a business as a corporation, it allows you to have a healthy disconnect. You're connected because you own it, but you're more disconnected because you're building some... It's like if you made a cake and you think, hey, I want everybody to just taste this cake because I'm, I'm going to make about five or six different cakes and I'm going to get until I get it right. So I made my first cake. What do you guys think? They go, ah, oh, we don't like this. Okay, what do you think I should change? Nothing personal. But if you say, hey, I made this cake. This has been passed down to my family. My mother, before she died, she gave this to me to make. Um, we eat this every holiday before we pray to God. Oh, God. Um, what do you think about this cake? It's amazing. All right, Shane. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. And, he, and if somebody does come back at you, ooh, that hurt. Ooh, that hurt. Because what you just heard is, they just told me my grandmother and my mother wasn't shit. She's rolling in her grave right now. Yeah, right. It's like, <laughs> right? For those of you who get little sister about mother jokes, sorry, might be a little sorry, too slow, but Okay, that was funny. We were laughing a little harder when, when the mic goes off. But the point is this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so the thing is that um, this is the beginning of making that healthy, healthy separation. You're not starting a partnership. You're starting a, a, a business corporation. Um, okay, now keep going. Rather than thinking of themselves as partners, they now think of themselves as shareholders. So, mm. you're not, see, when you say yourself as partners, you really see yourself as employees inside of this job you created for yourself. When you're shareholders, that means you are, your whole focus of getting together is to build something that will run where you are sitting back, where it will run without you. That's your. Day one, I want to build something that doesn't require me. So you don't never get baked into a role. So, for example, let's say you're doing a job and you, like, you love, say, cooking. And you cook it. Oh, man, Cor it's the best food we ever had. Oh, my God, that Caribbean-style cooking is amazing, right? And then all of a sudden, uh, I'll be like, yo, Corey, you need to stop cooking. You'll be like, this will be hard on me, bro. And then even when you stop cooking, you're over there micromanaging the new chef. You're over there overanalyzing everything because really you want to go back and cook. But if he saw himself as a shareholder, this is one of his restaurants. He can have 10 or 20, he can have different restaurants. He can even allow ideas from people that he come across, people he hire to enhance and grow the idea. Because the they, these are my restaurants. If he wants to personally cook for you, he'd do that at his house with his friends. See the difference? So that's why you got to start by saying, I'm a shareholder of whatever my business is. I am not a partner or I am not working this business. This is huge. This is huge. This shift in psychology is huge. Especially if you're just starting out or if you already have a business. If you adopt this philosophy, you'll see that now it's almost like the concept of working in your business and on your business. Or if you paint, you know, if, if those of you who are artists and have to paint, you have to get up close. If you stay up close the whole time, when you're done and back away, that motherfucker's warped. That's why you got to back up and look at the whole picture, go in, details, and then back up and look at the whole picture. When you, that, that detachment of your business allows you to see it in a much more potentially profitable way. Because if somebody says, well, you know, like the cake example, that's my grandmother's cake. This, and you go, and, and there's, a, there's a new trend that positively affects your business that partners with cake at the time, and somebody's like, you know what, you need to start selling those with the cake. How dare, that's disrespectful, that goes against the whole grain of what my mother, just do that shit. Because from a financial perspective, from a business decision, it could be a wise move, but when you, when you separate yourself and you look at yourself as a shareholder, then it, then it allows you to see it from a place of, how can I play the long game with this business to where it can be profitable for me? And, and, and here's the thing, dude, it's, this is important also because when you first start your business, you can get caught in an illusion that you're going to be here forever. So greens and grains, best salads in the Bay Area. I love making these salads. And they have to be made a certain kind of way. And, and she got into this personalization of it. She had to sell it. She just sold it recently. Big Sale Betty, one of my favorite sandwiches in the game. Right? They, 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 for, the, for, for Oakland, California, one of my favorite sandwiches. You go to New Orleans, Big Sale Betty's everywhere. But I'm talking about that style of sandwich. But here in Oakland, 
she doesn't see herself as a shareholder. So she has all these personal rules of how she's engaging. She's still there saying hi to people. I was there the other day, got a sandwich. She came out, hey, how you doing, right? Well, she forgets that that sandwich is good, but competition is coming. And before you know it, she, she'll go from the top to being normalized. Remember at one time, McDonald's was at the top of the game. You remember that? You go back to early, 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 early. When McDonald's was first being making their burgers, they were one of the best burgers in town. Now McDonald's is at the bottom of the game. But because they run it as a business, they're able to survive because they're able to continue to make adjustments. But if they ran it as if, 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 if McDonald's would personalize that, McDonald's would have died in the 70s. You guys can go with this? See, you got to be able to, the business has to constantly adapt, grow, and change. When it's personal, change is close to, it's hella hard because you're personalizing all those changes. So that's why the first move, I'm a shareholder of this idea I'm building, not I'm building this idea of my business. That language right there just made everything personal. Next. Ha having both worked in partnerships with other people and failed, Jack and Murray know that there's nothing more disastrous than a partnership gone bad, as so many do. Unless it's a family business, that is. Jack and Murray already know that family businesses are even worse than partnerships. So real quick, going to business with your girlfriend, your wife, your family member is fucking... It's tough. It's, tough. it's like... It's tough. It's like, it's like you, rush, you race against you say Bolt, but you just put on a military weight belt. It's tough. And you're carrying... A gallon of milk, and you running in pimp slippers. Pimp. Good, good motherfucking luck. Pimp slippers, though. <laughs> it, it ain't made for speed, baby. <laughs> With the like, fur coming out, the fur you know what I'm saying? And smooth leather bottles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you ain't getting no traction. You just. <laughs> it's it's like we we. <laughs> Let me just say this. Going back to the partnerships. Partnerships, treat, take partnerships serious. Be slow to partner with people. Stop letting partnerships be impulses. Learn people before you partner with them. Don't take the, the popular stories of their wins and make them a partner. Yo, I've been needing a partner. For wait, wait, it's your door alarm. I've been needing. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Somebody say, hey, Josh, shoot at the front. I've been needing a partner for five no, years. Go with him to the front. Run to the front. Run, 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 run to the front. That's Ashley. It's Ashley? Oh. What the hell? Oh. Did, you t did you cut it off? Somebody set off our alarm or system. How did Ashley? A who, Lord Jesus, somebody help that baby. In the middle of my class. Hey, you go get the strap, Josadi. I told Josh, Josh, like, I don't fight. Josh don't was fight. like, Josadi, come with Look, me. Josh, okay, I, 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 have to, I have to tell my Jewish joke. Josadi was like, uh, but Josh was like, I will sue them for you, but I'm not going up to the final. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it started, that's when the alarm went off. It was like, you know, somebody's breaking in your space. Sorry for those at home. That's what the alarm was like. Somebody's breaking into your space. I'm like, wait, what? And I'm like, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and right now in the COVID era, you, you just, it's, people are going through something right now, and I can't, I can't hold it against anybody. So um, no, Ashley can't. came in the house and decided to create a false alarm. So um, sorry, y'all. You know, in California, we get those false alarms every once in a while. Um, what was you saying? Okay, so with your partnerships, don't. Don't choose partnerships on impulses. Do not let people oh, give yeah. you this sales line of all their accomplishments and their greatness because a partnership is more than just what they achieved in the past or who they worked for in the past or what school they went through. It's also who are they as, are, as people? How do they handle hard times and good times? If you can come up with a, I call a purgatory partnership, which is, hey, let's collaborate on a couple of things. Let me make sure you get paid. And if this works, we can go ahead and discuss partnership. But go through something as much as you can with somebody first because partnerships automatically can compromise everything. Two, 
have a plan. If the partnership goes bad, you still can survive on your own. Because partnerships are great. Like with partnerships, let's say if, if me and Court are partnering on, on, on Court Smith basketball, Court can go take a vacation in peace because I'm going to run it the same level of, of, of drive as if he's here and, and vice versa, right? It gives us time to walk away and, and re-engage. Well, when you're by yourself, vacations are really kind of pseudo. All right, took one. Yeah, yeah they're pseudo. They're pseudo as hell. And so in the end, um, it's critical. Uh, a good partner is good. However, it's something that you, have, you should be slow to approach. Don't just automatically invite people to become your partner because they sold you a great pitch. It's so common. Like, you both, like, you're in a room, you're like, yeah, you like that? I like that, too. That's cool. That's cool, too. That's your favorite? That's my favorite, too. And all of a sudden, you're saying, okay, let's be a partner. No. Yo. Man. And, you know, the, the cold part about it? Like I said, I've been looking for a partner for five years because I know it's necessary, and I know I have weaknesses and blind spots that could that I could use assistance in and help him run my, my company. However, the reason why I'm super slow is because there's been times where I had jumped into some shit and never solidified a partnership separate from my business and other ventures, and, and but we never solidified anything, and then all of a sudden you there and you see their breakdown, and you're like, oh, shit. I'm so glad I ain't signed nothing with them yet. Because you don't re you don't know everything, and it takes time to reveal people's lot, you know, personality types, how they deal with problems, how they deal with stressors, and that that's a t that takes time. And you do business partnerships are deeper and deeper and stronger than marriages. It is, I, I, and uh, here they go. This she is gonna make us all go crazy. Lord Emma, she gonna walk in like it's normal. Anyway. Um, um, uh, Princess Bruh. daughter just sat, sat down in a chair with her all purple on. And maybe you have a question real quick. <laughs> Those of you who see there in black and white, you can't see all the purple. Plus, you know, some of y'all are colorblind anyway. But go ahead, um, Mrs. Prince. <laughs> um, so do you approach um, hiring employees the same way you guys are describing um, bringing on a partner? No. Hiring employees are much, much, much more difficult. And it's much more complex. I think we, we should have a, we have a class about it, but even with a class on it, there's really no perfect system because people are so well trained on how to wear a fake persona and how to lie in that space. And also because you are mostly already have a bias when you're hiring, it, it's, it's a very, and so with hiring, it's better to put, um, like one of the rules is to let multiple people sh talk to that person, but in some cases that's not even possible. And so what's cool, what's important with hiring is just, Creating a buffer space so if they don't work out, you know they're they're on probation period of some sort. But it, but but hiring, and I'm not sure if probation works in every state too how that works. So like like pay attention to your local laws. But hiring is not um, it's a very difficult thing. It's a extremely difficult thing. The best hires though also is referrals. And then one more add-on question. So if you n know that like. Okay, like let's say you're in a space where like you grew your business grew faster than what your infrastructure is supporting, and is it better to just like tough it out and wait for the right hire, or to add temporary workers in to do the work? Well, let's let's go to this list because this list is part of that. Okay. Let's go to this. All right, uh, next one. The next step. Jack and Murray take is to draw a line across a blank piece of paper about a third of the way down. Above the line, they write in bold letters the word shareholders. They have agreed with each other that it is to be their role outside of the business. Inside of the business, they have agreed they will, they will from this time forward think of themselves as employees. So they're doing a mental split, right? They have agreed we're going to be the shareholders of our business. But in this list we're going to create, we're going to also be the employees of this. But the goal is to get back to where we're just shareholders. But in this process of building a business, you're going to have to be the shareholder and the business and the employees. But they're making a very, very strong distinction of we will accept ourselves as being employees, but we are shareholders. And if you like, this is stupid. This is retarded. This ain't, this is stupid. This don't make no sense. Like, you got to open your mind and be willing to play this game because this is real. Because 
Making those small mental distinctions in your brain will create the capacity for you to hire employees. Because as long as you, you think this game is stupid and that you ain't, got, you ain't there yet, why are you even playing this? Then that's what's going to also limit you from even getting outside of that capacity. So we just remember that. Yes, ma'am. Murray agrees to Murray agrees to do the necessary research concerning the central demographic model they have tentatively chosen. How so, many? So, real quick. So, the first thing they had to do is they had to do a demographic model. Um, okay, keep, go finish. Yeah, keep, 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 they have chosen this. So, this is the demographic model I'm about to get into. Go ahead. How many potential buyers are there in the territory in which they've decided to do business? Is the population growing? What is the competition? How are widgets priced and how are they selling? Is there a future for widgets in the territory? What is the anticipated growth of the territory? Any zoning changes expected? That paragraph right there is a research you do before you start any business. This is, you tell me I know you haven't started your business. Hey, how much should I charge? What do you think I should charge for this product? You haven't done any of this work. Even like, I got this idea, Nana, go do this work right here. It'll take Nana off the table and put you, it'll put, the, the goal of this class is to make you the leader. If you answer, if you do the work and research these questions right here, this is when people start taking you serious about you. Look, if you came to me right now and you answered these questions here, and you just say, you stated like, okay, I did the research of this, 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 and you went through all these questions here, I'm automatically going to change the way I talk to you. I'm going to take you serious on a whole course going to change the way you talk. We will also, if you, if you show ownership in this area, we will also start to open up our connections to you. But if you can't answer these basic, basic questions here, we realize you're stuck in an ideal space. Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with you being in an ideal space. You're not a bad person. That's just a stage of the game. But in that stage, we can't take that stage serious because everybody's in an ideal stage. But this is, the, this is the beginning where you say, how do I build a business? It's not going down and getting a business license. That shit is so damn easy, it will make your nose bleed. And too many people come back bragging to me like, yeah, I went and got my LLC, and I had this done, I had that done. And just, <laughs> I'm like, do not talk to me about that. That's nothing. This is where the work starts. And I promise you, many of you guys running a business right now can't tell me the size of your market. Can't tell me a lot about your competition. Can't tell me, and you can't tell me um, how your widgets price and how they're selling. Like, and, and as well as, are you, are you, do you have your finger on the, the, uh, the, uh, the pulse of this area. So you're always watching it. Not, you, don't just, you don't get the information, but you're watching trends in these areas. You're watching behavior. You're, you're in deep observations. You're even going to these businesses. When you travel, you're looking for businesses in the new towns that provide these services and how they show up to these areas. Because even when you travel, you develop innovative ideas of how they may do it in, say, in Seattle, or in, in Portland may do it slightly different, which may give you innovation how you could do it in Oakland, right? But if you don't know these basic questions, then you're studying a hard, you're studying, you're starting either a hobby or you're just trying to create a job, but you're not trying to start a business. Hey, you, that's where it goes back. We talked about it. This, you have to be obsessed with this shit. Obsessed. When they ask you, hey, what, do you, what, like, what, do you, what keeps you up at night? It's not that you, it keeps you up in a negative way. Is that you you're, you're obsessed with this information because you know why? The more of this information you extract, that's where you'll find distinctions in your market where you could fit in. Oh shit! I just did the research and I didn't even think about it. I guess nobody's thinking about it because I did the research and only four people are here in this huge, wide open market. Let me let me st stick my toe in and see what happens. Like, that's where you'll find your distinctions. But you got to be obsessed. If you ain't obsessed with that, then it's going to be, you're going to get outworked by a lot of your, your competitors. So before you build your chart, do this work. Because you do, if, you do, if you don't do this work, you build your chart, you just made a, it's almost like, you might as well say, you are akin to Walt Disney because you just made some shit up. So do this chart, do this, answer these questions first. And this is, this is prepping you so when you do the chart, you have reference points, you have, it, it gives you, it, it solidifies your ideas as opposed to being some abstract, fluffy, 
Well, now I did a chart. I got about 45,000 positions here. It looks like it just looks like I'm designing a new infrastructure of technology, like almost like a Tesla should call me personally. But anyway, my point is that um, no, no, I need to ask you some questions. No, you don't need to ask me nothing. Here's the questions right here. Answer those questions, and it's going to give you kind of a clarity around what does it take. So, so, so you say, hey, I want to build my own car. You can go look at what roles are being played in the car company, and then you can even narrow it down. I'm only going to need this right now. I'm only going to need this. But at least you have an idea of what it takes to get from point A to point B. Like I, one of the things in the, even the video photography world, I see guys who go on shoots. And one of the things we realize is that, hey, you ever, ever watch a movie and they run all those names at the end? And then you see what they all do, you realize. And then when you start doing the shit yourself every day, you realize, okay, that role is important, that role is important, that role is important. But if you don't, if, but if you don't know those roles, you just run out there with a camera and start taking video and talking about, I'm going to go home and get on my Apple and make it, so I'm about to become successful. Dog, you might be able to produce one dope piece in your life or one piece every uh, two or three years, but you can't be a business like that. You guys, get, you see the difference? So answer these basic questions. Next one. Murray, Murray also agrees to create a questionnaire and mail it to a sample of their central demographic model consumers to find out how they feel they're treated by other widget companies. Mm -hmm. So you can mail this, and you can also make this part of a conversation. Hey, when you went to other GM, how did you feel about that? When you just, I'm talking about everywhere you go. You don't have to make this. Look, when you walk down the street and you say hi to somebody and you start have a conversation, hey, what do you do? Hey, I'm, I'm actually... Um, I'm a, I have my own um, gym. Oh, you do? Yeah. Let me ask you a question. You go to the gym? Which one do you belong to? How do you like it? What do you think they're doing really, really well? What do you think they can do better? That's the conversation right there. This is business shit here. That's the conversation. That's a, that is data for you to know how to build your business. He's like, no, how do I build my business? You got to figure this shit out. I, I, don't, I can't tell you that from a goddamn class. It's a process of going out and exploring through asking questions where you go, Yo, you just start being curious, and that's why we say be curious. So if you have any questions, and you start you start building a question into all your conversations, every new person you meet, and like there shouldn't be a soul that you don't flip and say, hey, you know, in this business, I, I run the same business. Um, you know, I, I sell this cream. You ever bought a cream like this before? From who? Well, what 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 about the cream you did like, and what didn't didn't you like? Hey, when Veronica came in, what I asked you, Veronica, about this class. Same two questions. What do you like about this class and what improvements do you think we need to make about this class today? Because that's how you grow. That's how you get better. And, and you got to have that pitch ready in your business because you get so much valuable information for free. Hey, check this out. In my world, hey, who, who makes your uniforms? What you like about them? What, and, and the shit that's irritating for them that they don't like, that is your list of what you embed in your company. And then that's your value Innovation. in your pitch. That's right. So, and they're like, what? You do that? And you do that? So, oh, shit, you're solving all of the problems that I have. That, and, and now you, you get conversions on customers. Now, keep going. This is all, this is, this is in the book. It's business. You can go back to the book, but this is, this, this chapter, I think some of y'all got caught up in some of that emotional shit and got stuck. Especially if you guys are stuck in that mental loop where you want to talk about yourself all day long. This is shit right here. This is stuff you guys have been asking for, and it's in the book, and it's so cold. Hit the next one. At the same time, Murray is to, is to personally call 150 of those consumers. He'll conduct a needs analysis to get a better understanding of how they think and feel about widgets. What do widgets mean to them? How have widgets changed their life? If they could have any kind of widget at all, what would it look like? How would it feel to use it? What do they want a good widget to do for them? They, my mm. God, they can't. They can't. That that's it. That's it. That, I mean, like literally, these. This is when you're out and about. You don't talk about who, how the Warriors going to play next year. You don't talk about what sales happening in the department store. You don't talk about the last funny couple of jokes you saw on YouTube. This is what you want to talk about first. Now, once this is talked about. Then you can go back and talk about this shit. You, you talk about all the shit you want. But all the high performing entrepreneurs I know, if you meet them, you're going to get one of these questions thrown at you. Just because they're used to, that's, look, you're not expected to sit in a room and be like, 
Uh, I had another great idea. I'm the guru of ideas. My creativity is so great. I can move you anywhere I want to. La, 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 la. No, that's not who you are. You gain those ideas from asking everyday people questions who give you the fucking ideas. Mm-hmm. Now y'all trying to see how cold this shit is? Mm-hmm. By you just going around asking almost like a, a template of questions that are about your industry, about your personal business, about the products you service that you provide for customers, you are getting tools on how to innovate, align, and compete. Hey, I had a salesperson on my staff. Um, he, in his mind, he was the greatest salesperson on earth, right? He was doing his job. And we had a sales consultant come in and do some, um, just some consulting on how to improve our sales. So she did some weird shit, but one of the dope things she did, she came in the office and said, give me the list of your customers. So we printed out the list with phone numbers. All right, put our phone down, put on speakerphone. Call customer number one. Hey, this is um so and so. I'm just he- you know I'm here from Court Smith, and I just want to get some feedback from you. How do you like your service at Court Smith? What don't you like about it? What do you like about it? Well, you know I love Vanessa. Vanessa's amazing. What do you- don't you like? Man, that Bobby, like damn, he's so slow. Like I tried to call him like three times, you don't call me back, and Bobby's sitting there. And we're like, mm-hmm. All right, thank you. Customer number two. By call caller number five, Bobby wants to crawl up under his desk, <laughs> right? <laughs> And, and so now we're seeing, like, okay, all this shit you're talking, like, that's how you get the, the customers are your lifeblood. That's how you get the nuggets and information you need to expand and grow. Like, if you're not doing that on a daily basis, sometimes your emotions and your ego about how well you're doing blind you to oh, the fact of how you're blinded. really doing. You can't trust your own perception. You cannot, you cannot trust your own. You, look, I'm telling you for somebody who's, Gained more weight and lost more weight in the world. You cannot trust you because your brain at, when I, at my biggest and my smallest, I always saw myself the same size. And if the rest of y'all in this room, y'all know what the fuck I'm talking about. No, no, sub, sub goose, goose, like I don't know what fuck y'all talking about. The rest of y'all, y'all know what the fuck I'm talking about, right? And the reality is that they, they, your brain cannot see fluctuations and variations and, and how you perceive because your brain is always repainting the story to make it look good to you. But they ain't got in the way that have nothing to do with the way the world views you. And so, if you're not in that constant conversation, if you're talking to people, if you're talking to your customers about anything else, you're not doing business. You're you're using them to to, to heal some of your psychological woes. Uh, so next one. Jack and Murray sit back and look at the completed organization chart of Widget Makers Inc. and smile. It sure looks like a big company. The only problem is that Jack and Murray's names will have to fill all the boxes. <laughs> so what they do is, so real quick, this part that we skipped. So Jack and Murray sat down and they wrote down what will it take to run this company from the CEO all the way down to the person who's going to be mopping the floors, janitorial service. And they, filled, they wrote in all the roles of all the people required to do the job, right? And when they sit down, you may have, damn, I need 20 people. I need 10 people. I need five people. Whatever the number is. And now, when they write it down, in the beginning, it's just Jack and Murray. They name it, like, okay, I'm choose to be CEO, which is important because you both can't do the books. If court does the books, I need to see something about the books. I need to give you a call court. I need to see the books. And then court needs to be responsible for keeping the books updated. Otherwise, what's going to happen is that after a while, you're going to be messed up on a lot of your numbers, and you mess up your number, that's your bloodline. Everybody can't be the CEO. Everybody can't be the, the um, everybody can't manage the internal team and everybody can't manage outside relationships. That's a lot of fucking, because here's the thing. Although you are skilled enough to do all those, if you do too many of the wrong ones, you will find yourself in a situation where um, you'll be filled with so much noise, you'll poorly perform in some other areas. Other thing is that you may also, because let's say Court is like a dope-ass, brilliant-ass dude, and he's, he's just dynamic in everything he puts his hands on. And let's say I'm really good at a couple things, but I'm not really good at a lot. Of, I think I'm not good at a lot of things. Once we finish the charts, you may find out that really he does all the fucking work. 
So now he needs to shift some network towards me. And maybe all the anger he was having that he didn't even know why because he's just such a Man, driver. He doesn't crazy. even know it. And so now he realizes, oh, shit, I should give you these five things. And now he's breathing. Now he loves what he does. That's but real. without that chart, that's real. He'll, be, he'll carry so much of this shit on his shoulder and will literally burn the company down with himself and not even know he's doing it because he never was able to look at it. That's real shit. Um... So, so, okay, cool. so the only problem, go ahead. The only problem? Let's start with the only problem again. The only problem is that Jack and Murray's names will have to fill all the boxes. They're the only two employees. Go ahead. But what they have effectively done is describe all the work that's going to be done in Widget Makers, Inc. when its full potential is realized. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they're very clear on what is all the work that has to be done. And so when you sit down on this chart, mind you, because we're going to do a retreat with the staff so we can work on clean, doing a, because me and Michelle built one, but we're like, okay, we need to clean it up. But that means every piece of work that needs to be done, it, I'm talking about taking out the trash and, and refilling the water section or the snacks is a job. It's not something that whoever's free can get it done. Everything is down on the list of a job, right? And you're very, very aware of all the individuals that are required to do the job, right? Keep going. Jack and Mary realize that there's no difference between the widget makers of today and the widget makers of tomorrow. The work is the same, only the faces mm. will change. So, this is critical. Once you're clear about the work, the people don't matter no more, Shakina. The people don't matter no more. There's no more, there's no more I gotta have Goose because Goose is... There's no more, the stories are gone. Because you realize as long as that role is being fulfilled, it's like a football, it's like it's the Bill Belichick approach. I don't really give a shit who plays this role as long as they understand the role and they deliver what my you hit your metrics. If you hit your metrics, this engine's gonna do what it's supposed to do. But the way many of us get caught up into is we start personalizing roles. We start thinking about, well, of court leave, what's gonna happen to the company? Court just left. You feel that role very right clear what that role is. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. This shit is this is this is the game right here. Mm -hmm. And the book talks about the damages of that, the damage of having a hero type of human in your in your business because everybody's human at the end of the day. And if emotions fly, new opportunities come, they overinflate their value or realize their value and they dip. You fucked. So you have to you have to as. As a radical responsibility entrepreneur you are, you have to look at all the bar variables from your chessboard, from above the chessboard, and say, okay, so if, I know we're in love with each other, but if just some random shit popped off and it didn't happen no more, how, how, will, how would I recover? And start putting those things in place now. Keep going. Okay, go ahead. A position, a position This shit right here. Okay, real quick. <laughs> This shit this right shit here. This shit right here. <laughs> that's you know that's that's so funny. The cat wheels get the credit, but that's how we talk in these locally. But like, <laughs> that's just how we talk. It's so my New York and Chicago and Texas and uh, all the East Coast folks. That's just how the fuck we talk. But this shit right here. This this is secret sauce here. This is a shit that I promise you most people don't understand this. But this shit right here is gonna change the game when you get it. Not good. Let's go. A position contract, as we call it at E-Myth Worldwide, is a summary of the results to be achieved by each position in the company. The work the occupant of that position is accountable for, a list of standards by which, by which the results are to be evaluated, and a line for the signature of the person a line for the signature of the person who agrees to fulfill those accountabilities. So let me be clear. So let me map this out your head. You built your chart up. You have all the roles. Chef, sous chef, uh, dishwasher, um, waiter, waitress. Oh, no, no, sorry. Chef, sous chef, waiter, waitress, uh, cashier. Bus boy. Bus boy. Like you just, okay, yeah, so you got that whole list, right, of your business. Now you need a position contract. Position contract is not a job description. It's what is that role, if you take that this role on, what is your responsibility? What are you accountable for? This is very, this is so cold. Keep going. 
Jack and Murray know that a position contract is not a job description. Therefore, the position contract is the document that identifies who's to stand up and what they're being counted on to produce. Mm -hmm. So that's very clear. So if this area falls, if me, if me and Corsa are only two people in this business, and that position contract, I'm in charge of this. If that area fall, I don't say, yo, what happened? He'll say, no, no, what happened? And also, I'm immediately jumping on top of it when it happens, because I realize it's my responsibility. Not, uh, well, what happened was radical responsibility. Not to be, think about radical responsibility when you have a position contract. Now when something happens, I'm always taking radical So that means that I'm also mentally owning that problem. That problem is no longer just floating in the company and somebody get to it, we get to it. I now have eyes on that problem. I'm babysitting that problem. Keep going. Having completed the position contracts for the positions within their new company, Jack and Murray, as shareholders, proceed to the most critical task of their new association naming the people to put in the boxes. Mm -hmm. So you start naming the people to put in the boxes. Keep going. Mm -hmm. If the business is to give them both what they want, someone will have to take it very seriously indeed. So you're talking about, so now, mind you, the CEO, whoever's going to be a CEO, has a person who's going to take it the most serious. Doesn't mean that at some point everybody won't take it just as serious, but who is going to stay up at night? Also, here's the hard part about being a CEO. It ain't, it ain't, um, it ain't, put the king in the throne and celebrate you. It's you also take the hardest hits. So when me and Mashama first started fighting in media, Mashama was set on, you get a portion of, every job you do, you get 50% of it. Now, when enough money didn't come in where I couldn't get a salary, I just didn't eat. I'm not exaggerating with that. I'm talking about I was broke, broke. At one point in fighting media, I think I took home $800 a month. My rent at this time, this is back old rent, was six fifty a month. So y'all see where I'm at, right? Because now mind you, Mashama took on maybe three thousand. But once again, that was not as a CEO, I have to take it a little bit serious than he has. And it means I also have to own the seriousness of all the other things that go along with that. I think mm -hmm. sometimes we think the serious, we think about, oh, I'm just serious about business. No, no. no. That means you seriously own all the fucking responsibilities and the losses and the wins. Yes. So you take less up front, but you get more out, up on the back end. Let me be very clear. So in the end, you pay all your, you don't call, you don't go to your, you don't, I couldn't go to Mashama and say, ah, Mashama, remember I promised you 50%? Well, you know, things are kind of rough this month. So what if I just front you 25? No. I had to put my big boy pants on and be like, damn, how's that, how's that steak? Tastes good? Man. I'm going to go home and just see if I can find me a fruit tree. I'm good. Like, literally, it was a different conversation. Y'all yep. think I'm joking. It's that much of a separation. I've had people come to me like, should I pay them? I didn't make that much money. I don't really care. You're CEO, right? Because when the money flips and you start getting a huge portion and all this money is 20, 40, 50, 20, 30, 40, 50, and all of a sudden that accumulation is millions, and, they're and at the end of the year, they may make half a million to a million, and you made 25 million, well. Right. Hey, right now, that's much the situation right now. All my employees make more than me per month because I set it up that way. And I'm cool, I'm cool with it because as, as the, the leader of the company, it's my job to ensure that the agreements that I make with my, with my employees happen. And, and, I'm, and, and that's the other thing about uh, a company contract. It's, psych it's a psychological thing that happens when you put responsibilities on paper and at the bottom they have to sign their name. When you sign your name, there's a certain level of integrity that goes with that. Now you take it serious. It's a level of seriousness that happens when you sign your name and date on that, on, on that contract. So, like, use, that, use, use those, that priming and framing to your advantage when it comes to your employees. If you don't do it, if it's just handshakes and you know each other and it's good, you're going to lose that, that small level of, of consistency or commitment with having a paper and having them sign it. Yeah, I know we partners, I'm, but sign this shit that you're going to do A, B, C, D, E, and F. Next one. 
not a bit of work had been performed on the job, and yet the two of them were able to conceive of the company, the work that needs to be done, the standards by which they would hold each other each position accountable. So I'm sorry, the standards of what they would hold each other accountable. So once you realize what kind of work needs to be done, you sign a, 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 you sign a, a, sign a contract uh, for the position, now you also have to be clear on what standards you have to uphold in that position. Even if it's just me and him, if you're going to call customers back, what, what level of service am I going to uphold? That if one day I get sick and you have to grab the same phone, you have to uphold that same level of standards. That's not to be compromised. But keep going. Mm -hmm. And which position is accountable to which position, and specifically for what? So that's very, okay. So that that is the beginning of system development. Mind you, you might get it wrong when you first build a chart. You may have to recalibrate it until you get it right. But who responds to who to get the job out? Everybody just can't be responding to everybody. Everybody can't be talking to everybody. Everybody can't be making decisions. Because as soon as you get the third person in, and the third person's like, who do I ask when I need this? And you're like, oh, well, I can do it. But if he's free, he can do it. Well, we kind of both do it. No, 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 no. I do this. You do that. Stop calling me for this. Call him for that. So when we have a problem, I know who to talk to. And then we can, and he also can own a solution. But if I have 20 problems and I don't really own them, that means they tw there are 20 unattended problems. But if there's 20 problems and 20 people own them, then all 20 individuals can give their problem the attention it needs to go to the next level. Yo, and understand, there can be no drop off. So that's why it's so important to have your, st your standards set and your documentation there and your training to where whoever owns it, if it's multiple people that owns it, it can't be no drop off. So if I walk into your establishment day one and I see Shakina and Shakina says a certain uh, set of things to me that make me feel warm and welcomed. And then I come back two weeks later and it's another person. They're like, what the fuck you want? Then then there's a drop off. That means that person wasn't trained well, and now it's inconsistently, and I don't want to go back. So whatever system in place that you find that works for you, then you have to establish that because the standards everywhere have to be at that, at that level. So well said. Next. Having completed the position contracts for the, for the positions within the new company, Jack and Murray, as shareholders, proceed to the most critical task of their new association naming the people to put in the boxes. If, if the business is to give them both what they want, someone will have to take it very seriously indeed. Next one, I think I'm like read that, that was a duplicate. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's weird, go ahead. But at the bottom of the organization, not at the top. They start working on the business where they start working. Okay, so real quick. So, so this, this next step, so sweet, I love this shit. So now you got the chart laid out. So now you wrote your name into it, like, so court, Nana, court, court, Nana, 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 court, Nana, court, Nana, court. We got the work balance. We got the skill level alignment. We got the standards set up. We have the expectations clearly defined, right? So now we know exactly when I come to this office, this is what you got to take care of. So we might be switching our hats around, but we understand very clear, and we're not stepping on each other's toes no more, and we're not letting anything be un, um, unattended because we're both kind of like doing this, too much of the same thing, right? So now that we're very clear about that, this is the process. You go to the bottom of your chart, and they start working on the business where they start working in the, they, okay, so start, we go through this chart. So but at the bottom of the organization, not at the top, they start looking at the lowest role. So janitor, uh, cashier, um, administration, um, um, project management, whatever your low role is, you define, you start from that chart. When you finish looking at that chart, the people at the bottom of the chart, this is where you start. There you go, here you go, here you go. This is cold. This is, this is the secret sauce. Go ahead. They start working on the business. What happened, your microphone off? They start working on the business where they start working in the business. In the position of salesperson and production person and accounts receivable clerk. Not mm -hmm. as the owners or partners mm -hmm. or shareholders not as the COO or the VP of marketing, but as employees at the very bottom of the organization doing tactical work, not strategic work. 
Tactical work is the work all technicians do. Strategic work is the work their managers do. Mm. Can you read this? Can you keep one? If Jack and Murray's business is to thrive, they have to find other people to do the tactical work so as to free Jack and Murray to do the strategic work. So, you're looking at the chart and you realize all the stuff at the bottom are going to have to be outsourced at some point. You, you can't. Right? Two, when you start, when you, so let's say tomorrow, court has to get in front of the cash register and, and take money in. But now when court is taking the money in, he's thinking about it as a position, not as a job. Let me see what we're talking about. He's taking the money in. Hi, can I help you? And he's like, let me just test and see what works best. Let me see what's this. And he's analyzing it every day. And he's like, yo, what if I change this? So as, and then at the end of the day, he writes down what worked really best. Yo, if I said this first, it worked best. I read this article last night. I tried that. It worked best. Um, or when I wore a blue shirt, it worked better than when I wore a brown shirt. Oh, my God, when I, when I did it this way and I cut the service down by this amount of minutes, or when I took a little bit longer, it made it actually work better because it, it implied quality. Like you, you, he, He's been doing all these quantitative tests. So even though he's working a cashier, but why he's doing that, each role he takes, each role he focuses on one role at a time on that chart. And eventually through that write-up, everything he said that, that this, this works better than this, this works better than this, that's the new job description Man. for that role. So now when they hire a cashier, this is what you wear. This is how we deliver our service. This is how you show up. And this is how you do your job day to day. But the only way he's able to do that is that when he had to do the work, because it's just me and him, he analyzed it and documented what worked best down to a point that he had it down to a system. So then when he got ready to hire somebody, Shakina, he knows exactly what he's asking for, what skill level he's looking for, what personality type he needs. All this is now very, he's not guessing that based upon, oh, you know what, I'm going to hire somebody in marketing, and then somebody, oh, I got a marketing degree, oh, good, you came from Stanford, you here, and they fuck your business up. That happens all the time in big business. Oh, man. What you realize is by, because he took ownership as, even though I'm an employee, I'm, I'm also a shareholder, but I'm an employee right now. But I'm also looking at it as eventually getting to a point where I'm going to manage this role. And as I'm doing this role, even though I'm doing this job, I'm going to analyze this job so cold that when I pass it on to somebody, I'm able to tell them this is why we do it this way as opposed to that way. You guys see this? You guys see this powerful shit it's trying so to cold. unfold? And mind you, this happens over a period of time. So, so say he's doing cashier, then after, like, say by 2 o'clock, um, he's doing the books. Well, right now he's not analyzing the books. But when he gets comfortable doing the cashier, now he starts thinking about what's better ways I can do the books? What's ways I can improve the books? What's better ways I can stream? How can I save the company money by doing the books? And now as he designs that, now it's time to hire a bookkeeper. He's already analyzed that. Now you can yep. tell the bookkeeper, this is what you do every day. This is how you show up. This is how you do your output, your input. This is your whole role. Uh, now you have job descriptions. You have a how you build something. You have a what. You have a why. Now if I come in as an investor, or go to a, a new employee, Goose is now the cashier, hey, tell me about your job. Well, here, this is what our goal is. This is why we do it. We use this kind of system. This is our end goal. This is how we impact that. But where did Goose get that from? When you were a cashier analyzing and journalizing and journaling everything you did that day that worked and things that you just think, well, I don't think that worked. I want to test this new idea. Yo, that's so much fucking game. That's exactly how it happened. You basically described the shit. Like, that is the game. And and what the beauty the beauty of it is, w once you create the list, the list is now tactical. It's data points. So you've done all the work. You had the discernment. You also used your, used your experience and common sense and, and to come up with a formula so that you know they say when you hire somebody, you, you're not gonna hire nobody exactly like you. So if they're eighty percent of you or sixty or seventy. The system you create makes them still look is, is seamless. The standards are seamless. So, if, for example, uh, I, I'll take our business. Is that um, Sacramento buys differently from LA, and both of them buy different from the Bay of our product. So LA, you just gotta hike the prices up. How do we know that? Because we went down there, and the, so and the prices was just 
turn these prices up. Didn't do much, but just changed the prices and the perception change. Sacramento, the, 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 the slides earlier where it talks about doing the research before you even do anything, I sat there in the gym for two days. Fucking hella Under Armour shit. Hella military print shit. Hella hats turn like this in Sacramento. What product do I have that they will fuck with or can I create? I, I'm not going to bring the shit I sell in the Bay up here or most of it because it won't apply. Let me see what this military, all my military print shit does or like this or that into where I'm like, okay, I get it. So now it's just in the list. I don't got to be there. Like that is the, that, that is the game. And, and if you follow it, like that, it, you won't leave anything out on the way to where you want to be. So if you just all automatically starting with um, the third slide, be, you, you start in business because you want to be a boss or you want to be, you know, it, uh, you want to run shit, you want to be a boss, and you, your business card says CEO, then you're fucking up the whole process because you have to, you have to understand your positions if you want to, recreate it and play it well. Next one. Each of them ask, what would, be, what would best serve our customer here? How could I most easily give the customer what he wants while also maximizing profits for the company? And at the same time, how could I give the person responsible for that work the best possible experience. That's, that, that's, 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 that's position building. That's building a team right there. This is team building. You build the team before you have the team. You don't build a team when you need it. This is, you start pre-thinking about this stuff, it's almost like somebody's going to land in a perfect glove design just for them. But if you, if you just try to hire, if you hire somebody to build that for you, this is what he talked about earlier in the book, it can be disastrous because they can hijack your company with every good intent. They don't mean to hijack your company. They just do what they think works best for them based upon their experiences, based on their comfort zone, which starts to splinter your company or tear your company apart. I was just having this conversation with Tone the other day. You know, is that a lot of times people, they'll come in think, just using the tools that they think work or work for them, not spending the time to analyze what works for the customer. Like, this isn't about us, it's about them. How can we serve the customer? How can the customer respond at their most height the, their highest point to where it's favorable to make transactions financially to where it works for them. It, like, your favorite color doesn't matter. Like, who's the demo, what's the demographic's favorite color? If they love this kind of plum color, if that's, then you make plum. Not because this is your grandmother's favorite color and she passed away and she gave you some plum shit. That, it has nothing to do with you. Once we get that in our head, then we allow that customer service mentality to really seep down to our hearts, to our souls, to where we give a fuck. If you like, if you if you're in business, but deep down you have a fuck them, fuck customers mentality. I don't give a shit about a mentality. You don't think that that that's going to be apparent and that 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 it's not going to come to the surface. It does and it will. And and if if ain't nobody fucking with you. That's you know it's that's that's a good reason it might be it might be that reason. Go ahead. He begins to think about how Widget Makers Inc. interacts with his customers and how each component of this interaction could be modified to increase its effectiveness. Keep going. And as he quantifies the impact of his innovations on sales, he takes the most productive of them and writes them down in the Widget Maker Sales Operations Manual. See this? This is it. Before long, the sales operations manual contains the exact scripts for handling incoming calls, outgoing calls, meeting the customer at the door, the exact responses to customer inquiries, complaints, concerns, the system by which an order is entered, returns are transacted, new product requests are acted upon, inventory is secured. Keep going. Only when the sales operations manual is complete does Murray run an ad for a salesperson. There you go. So you see that? So I'm doing a sales, I'm doing the sales job every day because it's just two of us. I've defined how we deal with the problem. How do we get into the customer? How do we manage inventory? How do we manage complaints and compliments? How do we, how do we extend ourselves to a customer? And now, once all that's done, only then do I run an ad 
to hire. Keep going. But not for someone with sales experience. This is the trick right here, Shakita. Pay attention. This is, this is directly going to hit what you say. Don't, you don't have to go out and find a salesperson now. Be very clear about this. Black people, Latin folks, Asian folks, my Jewish partner, all of you guys, right? <laughs> this shit is game on top of motherfucking game. Say this again, but not for someone with sales experience. Go ahead. Not a master technician. Uh-oh, not a master technician. But a novice. A novice. A beginner. A beginner. An apprentice. Do you understand if you get your system tight, it brings your cost of employees, the most expensive cost of your business, way to fuck down? See, once you build a system, you can train everyday people who are intelligent to fill that role. That's how, okay, do y'all realize most of y'all get jobs and y'all ain't really qualified for those jobs in big corporations? Do you realize they train you into a role and then you take that title and go to a club and tell people that you're the marketing director knowing goddamn well they trained you on everything you're doing? And they gave you that title because they knew your ego loved to hear that word, director, leader, king, queen, master, superior, grand pooba, whatever the fuck they would have called you, right? But they, you just love that shit, right? But at the end of the day, they pre-designed that role so when you fit into that role, it's designed, they can just pull you out and plug another module in. That means no one person can stop the motherfucking show. Y'all get the game on that? It's, it just taught you how to hire the lowest talented person. Let me say this again. It's give you game on hire, how to hire the lowest talented person person because you learned how to you mainly learn how to record what it takes to do the job and that's how you train an everyday novice. That means, hey, I ain't got a big budget. If I can bring you in at $40 an hour, $30 an hour, $25 an hour, I can train you into the game. Right? Now, if you have to come to Excel, I can reward you. But if you suck, I can fire you and get another person in that role. Or if you're just mediocre, I can just add another person to that system and I'm okay. Mm -hmm. You guys see how cold this is? Mm. It's like, but that's because when you were doing the job that you do every day, you were taking it serious. This is called running a business. You were recording and documenting of what does it take to do that role so when that person fills your position, they know how and what, why, all that's answered in your documentation. So how does that apply when it's a job position where it requires technical knowledge like personal training? No, it's not true. The technical knowledge is the technical... It's a myth. It's a myth. If you're training somebody and you look at what you actually do every day, that could be in the manual. And if you realize what people actually show up every day and what they're asking for, if there's a specialist, specialist need, you can have a specialist position. But the everyday... The, but the bulk of your money probably comes in overseeing and, and um, um, coaching, overseeing, comforting supporting and being there for people, right? And giving them confidence and reassuring them. It's, I promise you, if you analyze it, that's because that's because you, you're personalizing your business. If you came out of being a shareholder, you would still look at your business and go, how can I break this shit down where technicians are irrelevant? Y'all had, you guys have had this conversation before here. And you, he asked you the question, what's the percentage of time of the shit of, of, the training that you do, where it's just basics, basic, basic. Go here, do there, do that, do that. And you were like in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So that means 90% of your employees can be basic, 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 elementary shit. And if there's a question that's beyond that basic, then that could be a specialist question. But most, if, if like if you step out and realize what that, that Rubik's Cube algorithm looks like, and you realize... Every time, 90% of the time, this algorithm works, so I'm going to work it. And if it doesn't work, only 10% of the time, I'll use the higher level one. That's business. That's really getting precise business. That's skilly. Because right now, you, the reason it's going to be hard for you to translate what we're talking about is because you've been personally overengaged. I got this degree, I got this certificate, I went through this training, I just, okay, you haven't been, you, you've been running a business as an employee. If you're running as a shareholder, you've been getting those roles, but as you're taking that class, you're like, how can I break this shit down where I can train um, my cousin to come and take this role right now? Mm -hmm. What about this is really technical, 
And what about this is really just I can put into a procedures and I can teach this to a group of people and they can all be like robots and follow that same system over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Once again, I tell you, no, I'm not trying to offend you by no means. But 24 Hour Fitness, Old Goals Gym, or any other major gym that have trainers, I promise you, they probably have one or two technicians. Okay, you can could, you could, you could foot that bill, but can you pay for five Kevin Durant's? You're going to need somebody, hey, your job is just pass as motherfucking, your job, just get a rebound and don't you do a goddamn thing else, right? Your job is just, hey, your job is just hit him. I don't give a fuck. You don't need to have, just hit him, <laughs> right? Because they used to have that, they used to have a bruiser on it. Back in the days, they used to have one dude like, when we call him in, somebody on your team might get fucked up. And they knew, oh, shit, here come bruiser. He can't dribble for shit. He can't shoot, but he can fuck you up, Right? Once you understand business, that we, when you're in the business, you over-romanticize. Because it, part of romanticize, okay, this is the cold part. This is for everybody. It's not really for her, but it's for everybody. But it applies to you, but it's really for everybody. When you're in the business as an employee, you start to over-romanticize certain roles that you're engaged in because it has to do with raising your self-value. See, it's hard to say, I sweep floors every day and be at the club and think people are like, what? What kind of broom you use? How much dust do you see in your life? No, it doesn't happen. So in the end, you might say, well, you know, um, I'm, I'm a maintenance technician. And as a maintenance technician, we work with some of the highest chemicals. I, I have to wear a hazmat suit some days mm-hmm. to get to the point. You mean when you clean the toilets out? Right? Mm-hmm. But in the end, we're going to amplify it. So then if you see yourself as an employee and you test your value to it, that's why I said it's personal, I say, hey, break that down to technical. You'd be like, well, how would I break down a maintenance technician? Right, right. It just seems to, there's chemicals here that, I mean, you don't have to have a degree to understand how these come together. Motherfucker, if you don't put that in a, fill in a pre-designed box, I mean, b- bottle, pour this bottle in this bottle and with this kettle of water, stir. Mm-hmm. Put this suit on and mop. Mm-hmm. Next, do it again, do it again, do it again, 20 hours an hour, ha, gotcha. Now, if you innovate and you do something greater and you go further and I can make more money off your innovation, hey, I share the profit. Everybody, got, everybody needs to win. There's no zero-sum game here. I believe in everybody's success. But what you don't do is get into the idea that whatever the fuck we do, Goose is a, Goose is a creative, uh, I call him a genius, fuck it. He really is. He just sometimes don't believe it. But he's a creative, he's a creative fucking kid. He gets fucked when he starts thinking he's special as opposed to how can I just break this shit down? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Hey, at Intel, when I worked at Intel, they make computer chips. But the way they broke this down follows this to a T. No matter how complicated the process is, you have operations technicians. You can, you can have hella operations technicians because it's the bottom of the level. They write the procedures of what you do. You go, you press button one, press button three, press button four, you wait 15 minutes, you take the thing out, you move it to the next um, next section. Now, for every 10 operations technician, you had one equipment tech, which means that person was more knowledgeable in how to fix shit in case it went wrong, any processes. That person you had to pay 90K a year. The other ones you can pay 20 to 30. You know how valuable financially that is for the business? Because shit goes wrong maybe 10% of the time, that person's there to fix it, for every 10. Now for every equipment technician, there's one engineer. One engineer oversees that group. Now you gotta pay that engineer 110, 150. But it gets, it, the, the math gets good because 90% of the work though gets done by the $12 an hour folk. That's what makes that value. And it's not saying you don't have a profile. You, you, when you do the work, you'll see, okay, nobody's gonna come into a trainer who eats chocolate bars while they have a consultation, right? Or, or if my stomach is sweaty and it's sticking outside the bottom of my pinpoint shirt and it's a triple X, right? That may not translate really, really well for your industry, right? Might be great for a story afterwards, but not for your industry. So you do have a profile. You might find that tall people are more attractive to people who want to train than short people. You might find it vice versa. You might find a woman who's a little thick is a better trainer than somebody who's super skinny. Right? This is all going to be learned from that engagement, conversation, dialogue, right? But what you can't, but once you get that profile, 
there's a plethora of people you can pull from that profile, as opposed to you gotta go to this school. Like, think about how the things we, we end up creating these limitations. You have to go to this school, you have to analyze this way, you gotta walk this way, you gotta do this. By the time you put all these li limitations, what you just really described was I need a perfect rendition of me, and if that doesn't exist, uh, I guess I can't grow. Yeah, no, no business can do that. No. None. None. Um, Chelsea has a question online. Okay, go ahead. She said, I understand creating systems so you don't have to hire the best and brightest. But companies like Google, Twitter, certain engineering consulting firms put potential employees through hellish interviews. Is this only for certain levels of employees? I certainly don't want a person doing high level work at my company to be mediocre. Okay, so first of all, let me be very, very clear. When Google first started, they was new just like everybody else. And Google would tell you, if you read the history of Google starting their business or any of those companies starting their business, first of all, the CEOs of those companies are not really talented CEOs, let's be very clear. They were, they were engineers and technicians that had, became CEOs, right? Three, what you'll find is that a lot of them that were going through that process, they were heavy, top heavy in talent when they were small. If you go to, see, if you go to Google now, they are giving up on the best, the best, most talented people. That shit is a myth to them even. Look at the turnover rate of the best and most talented people. What you'll find is you'll find people who share their passion, their vision, and where they're trying to go. And so what they really try and do is prime you, right? They, they're selecting. They even stop. Remember, Google's the first one to say, we're over the college degree. But if they were that serious, then they'd be like, no, if you don't come from the prime colleges, if you don't da 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 they realize that shit don't work. They can get more... If I can design this position well, and you fit the profile to learn, because you have to also be capable of wanting to learn and adjust to the challenges I'm going to give you. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to take Goose, and Goose ain't read a book since uh, the day he was, the, the day uh, after five, when his mom used to read with him, he ain't read nothing else. Well, that's not the person you want to hire. Or you don't want to hire that person who has, who's a narcissist. Or There are certain things you're going to be looking for when you're clear about that position. So it's not, it's not, it's not saying you're going to hire the dumbest of the dumb or the, the least valuable of the least valuable. But what you'll find is that your range of how many people can hire by building a system will go from maybe the top 40 to the top 400,000 or 40,000. Because now if they fit a certain profile, a certain mindset, a certain attitude, certain behavior, right? Also, a lot of their process they're going through, like I just told you, the behavior science the, the, there's so much research in psychology to tell you there's no really perfect interview mm -mm. system. Mm -mm. So what they're doing is loss aversion combined with priming you. But in the, re the reality of it, if that was a perfect system, they would take... Like Google, if you ask the hiring like this, the HR person... Matter of fact, we have an HR person president in the company. Is, is there a perfect hiring system? The, the perfect... Cassandra said no for those of you at home. She's so smooth. She doesn't even have oil in her neck. Just... <laughs> so anyway, she said no. So the point is that the, the reality is that a lot of times companies engage in these processes to protect themselves. But really, if you go through Google and you were to interview individual people, and I know a lot of people work at Google, a lot of those people don't really, Google's so large now, most of those people are not super tight dope. It's a, it's a small collective few, and they protect those, just like Apple. Apple, everybody working at Apple ain't geniuses. I know a couple. Trust me, we, I know more, I, trust me. But what happens if you small, because sometimes you get lucky and depending on the kind of industry you're in, the kind of money coming your way, Google's able to play this high. But the average everyday business, let's say you decide you're going to start a baking company that's going to grow pies all over the nation. You can't look for the top chefs. You got to look for people who are comfortable and familiar with baking and have some experience with baking. And then you could train them at certain levels. And after a while, you could train to a point that they don't even have to have experience with baking. Look at the top companies who, who have cooked, who copied and pasted themselves and expanded themselves. They haven't been able to expand that core team. That core team is always changing things and redesigning and testing things. But then once they, once they design it, they break it down to simple procedures. And then they de deploy those procedures to all their different franchises or stores. So when you're scaling, if you're just building a small business and you can get the best person, who wouldn't, right? If you can get Steph Curry on your team, take him. But what we're saying is that if your team only can win if Steph Curry plays, and if Steph Curry just has a bad day, the team just completely fails, you don't have a championship team. Yeah, and this thing too, there's some things you can control. And one of them is this, Chelsea, is you have an advancing culture. 
That's what we call what I've learned. You call it an advancing culture, which means you embed the culture of your company and your rhythms of your company and how you move to where if employees come in, they have to be able to, to, to move within your rhythm, whether that's a fast-paced rhythm or this kind of rhythm or you guys like to challenge each other, whatever the rhythm you create. Capital each other, jokes. Whatever it is, they ha like you create that rhythm within your company so that it's going to be clear if that employee can fit in. And that, those can also be some of the interviews about understanding, like, what are their rhythms? You know, th 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 that's one thing. Two is, is you have the second part of your advancing culture is that you're always pouring in to your employees. Because a lot of times it's can they learn or do they have the capacity to learn? Because them being able to fit in your rhythm is major. Then, if you're constantly pouring into your employees, meaning they're in a constant, you guys are all in a constant state of growth, then you're you're realizing the capacity of these folks that you're hiring, so that they may come in and they may be okay or a, a, a B minus. But if if it's mandatory like it is at our company, I think it is here. Like in a lot of companies that I know that really perform, it's mandatory we read book. We 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 in a book every month, and we talking about that shit. And we working on our, ourselves, and we challenging each other to work on. We, we're we're doing introspections with each other all the time. Um, we're listening to podcasts all the time, and we talking about that shit. So if you ain't about that life, it's gonna be clear two months into the game, and it's like, okay, so what about you? What do you think about it? And they're like, uh, well, shit, uh, I didn't read it. Then the culture is going um, is going to turn. It kind of turns on you, and you're gonna feel that weight to where like, man, I. Ain't, I ain't trying to do all this shit, or this is dope, or six, eight, nine months down the road, that person who was okay is now killing because your advancing culture helped elevate them. So yeah, so you're looking for personality types, personality alignment, integrity alignment, value alignment, um, um, culture alignment, all those things are what you're going through the interview for. Talent and skill, th those are very few roles. Majority of people at Google, if you, I promise you, you talk to a hiring manager for any major corporation, they tell you most of those people are not the thought system that makes the system run. Most of the people on the company are cogs on the wheel. Somebody else is designing the wheel system. So, um, some, so not a master technician, but a novice, a beginner, an apprentice, someone eager to learn how to do it right someone willing to learn what Murray has spent so much time and energy discovering. Keep going. And as Murray interviews the candidates, he shows them the sales operations manual and widget makers strategic objective and explains how they were created and why. He tells them the story of widget makers, the dream he and Jack conceived to enable them to make a personal difference in the market in which they have chosen to become leaders. So see, there's a culture right there. So when he's hiring somebody, Google, like when you go to Google, you can feel the culture. I mean, I don't like Google culture, it's not my thing, but you can feel the Google culture like you can't feel anything else, right? So when these people in these places hire you, um, you automatically know um, what you're being a part of. Number two, um, they also answering the big question we talked about this class before, know your why. They're introducing the why to all the employees. Now all the employees have to echo the why. That means if you catch one of Google employees on the streets, they can describe to you their, their, their reason for being there, what Google stands for, what they believe Google. You ever, you know, you ever hear somebody, a reporter goes, hey, as black people, what do you think? And you go, well, you know, I, I think what we feel in this situation, we do that, that's instant, right? We can't speak for all black people, but that's how you feel like you can. You feel like we own that conversation, that why. Well, they help you develop that conversation of why about the company. And that's part of that process that you're building. So when you bring that person in and they, you go over the book and you train them, this is why we're here. This is what we, makes us unique. This is our position. This is why you were hired. This is what we expect of you. Okay, so there has to be some kind of a valuable person there. But a novice, a beginner, I didn't say a person don't give a fuck. A novice and a beginner as opposed to an expert or a top of line person. If Google had to hire only experts and top of line people, it's actually not just about money, it's also about 
a whole bunch of entitled egos arguing all goddamn day. Hierarchy yes. is necessary. So somebody has to be able to say, hey, teach me, or hey, I'm curious. And the way you, you forge, the way you forge curiosity is by having a structure. If you don't have a structure, then people are competing for value and they're destroying your company. It's a mob. I know Silicon Valley for a second was was playing with the idea of having a flat organization because of maybe it was social job I don't know but it was having a flat organization to where you could walk into the CEO's office and tell them how you felt and um, and back and forth the dialogue and now there's some pros to that which means ideas that come great ideas that that come from the bottom don't have to get stuck in 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 the hierarchy or the the muck of a bureaucracy they can go they can move freely in terms of ideas but it also gets super messy it gets super messy so like like just like how societies ran around the world your business you you, you can play with different business models to see which ones work best for you and your leadership style because you know some people may be good at a at a more top down method some 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 folks may be a little bit better by merging the two to say, all right, we don't have a top down, but we're gonna mix it a little bit um, with the flat organization so that everyone feels like they have a voice, but it has to work for you. If it doesn't work for you, then you can't enforce it because you, you, you're not running it. Next one. And when he finds the right person, Murray hires him, hands him the sales operations manual, has him memorize the words in it, dressed to code, learn the systems, and finally go to work. Using the, the sales system, Murray innovated, quantified, and orchestrated. At that moment, at that exact instant, Murray moves up to the position of sales manager and begins the process of business development all over again. So here we go. So now that he's developed that role, he's hired you. At that moment, he's now the sales manager, and he starts treating the sales manager the same way he treated the previous role, which is analyzing it, quantifying it, processing it, documenting it, designing it. And then when he's done, he's ready to hire for that next role. You see where we're going with this? Now, this is the, this is, this is the beginning of you're, you're building a business in a sense. Nothing to when you use like companies like Google and stuff like this. It's really hard to use this because those companies are getting paid massive cash to flood with a lot of labor and bid for the highest quality labor. You can't play that game. You're playing, most of us are going to play, majority of people in this world are going to play small business, the big business game. And small business, the big business game is when you're small, it's not about just polishing a product every day and get it to the customer as fast as you can. While you're polishing that product, you have to be aware of the processes you're creating and then looking at how to improve those processes so you can pass that process on to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Because at that moment, Murray has taken the most important step in freeing himself from the tactical work of his business. Murray has replaced himself with a system that works in the hands of a person who wants to work it. And now Murray's job becomes managing the system rather than doing the work. Murray is now engaged in strategic work. This shit. I can't even, <laughs> like, I can't even do it. Like, if y'all just follow this chapter along and just stick to the script, Man. I mean, like, Literally, don't skip it. Stick to the script here. You know how much money and a heartache you could save by just following this shit. Like there wasn't this. Maybe no. it, you know, or I didn't have. I you didn't read this book. Yeah. I weren't aware of this book. But it's almost, almost fortune telling. Almost is that precise in terms of the steps that it takes. And this is so much game for free that you're getting that if you followed it just really blueprinted yourself um, a model of this like you'll be miles ahead of the game alright shit let's jump into Ego's Enemy because we got, we got hold on a second let's get oh a second we're going to jump into Ego's the Enemy we got to, we got to move the screen I just need the back one the, just hold the heel yeah. part yeah the, the because heel, the heel part yeah so we're going to do Eagles and Enemy. Um, yeah. So, um, <laughs> y'all ready to move forward? You know what's so crazy? Th tonight, y'all, we have a room full of beautiful women and, and, and uh, Goose. 
And <laughs> which that's why Goose ain't left yet. Goose well, has all these beautiful women in one room. Um, it is amazing. And then she gonna give us this to distract us. It's just this is too many. This is too much woman energy tonight. But in, by, based on Shabisha rule, this may give us superpower. So yeah. you know, because Shabisha will tell you. A woman has so much power that's untapped is ridiculous. So I think we're getting our superpower. Hey, way. a woman is the closest thing we got to God. Yeah, hey, my, there you go. Hey, hey, I'm hey, saying. come on with it now. Come on. Come on now. Let's go. Um, let's, 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 let's jump into this eagle's enemy because I want to, hey, we got a lot to cover. Go back and read that chapter. Study that chapter. That's, the, that's magic sauce. We give you our magic sauce moving forward now. This shit crazy. And this class is going, like, this class is going to be a class where, Hey, you can't blame us. You got that's what you can't do. And two, we're gonna create the environment to support you. So even if you're not at the point where you're willing to make those changes, or you're trapped in a mindset, the whole goal of hope and the things that you guys have been investing in is creating an environment that will support those of you who have the desire but are so backed up in what you're willing to do that it feels so far away. And we're gonna and the goal is to help you get there. But that. <laughs> That there, if you have a business, go She's back and crazy. audit your business. Yeah, I, maybe I'm a nerd, but that last slide gave me goosebumps. Like that last slide on Not e the Beyonce e one. The one before Beyonce. E -Myth. Yeah, e -Myth. <laughs> Yeah, I mean. Because <laughs> Beyonce got to give me, like, e no, we were going. <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> but like, it's so, so dope. Like, it's so much game. Yeah. Crazy. Anyways. Yeah. Like, y'all don't understand. Like, that, that was the elementary start here with an idea do this, do that. By time, look, if a investor meets you at that end point, oh, it's a whole different conversation. Whole different conversation. You're a whole different, and it just, it's really like, just remember this nothing great's happen, nothing great happens easy. Shit, you didn't get here easy. Nothing great happens easy. And so it's a process, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be super or gifted or special mm -hmm. or unique. You just gotta be willing to commit to the process. All right, let's roll. Let's roll. This is come on. Let's go. Let's go. I'm not. I'm. I'm hyped. Let's go. The, <laughs> the fighter Baz Rutan sometimes writes the letter R on both his hands before fights, for the word rustic, which means relax in Dutch. Getting angry, getting emotional, losing restraint is a recipe for failure in the ring. Mm. Okay. Mm. Okay. Let me say this real quick. For somebody who negotiates contracts all the time, somebody who's in meetings with a lot of people who are from races to in favor of our race, to so people who are, who, and they're not racist because they're bad people, they're racist because they have these negative assumptions deeply built into their system. And they don't know they do. But they already are, make, they almost give me, make one mistake and I promise you I'll cut your black ass. And there's this thing called, um, and I, may, I may be using the words wrong, but it's, I think it's called discrimination tax. Discrimination tax is when um, when somebody discriminates against you for being race or gender or sexual preference, they actually become dumb when they engage it. And when they become dumb when they engage it, they become easy prey for us to tax. And the, what, what they become, because they become easy prey, what happens is if you're good, you learn to tax them for their, for their mistakes. So if I'm foolish enough to think that you're a woman and you don't know much, I will almost lower my guards and approach it, assuming that you will fall by a certain technique, and I will leave myself wide open and vulnerable for you to take me down. Yep. Right? That's called discrimination tax. It's a lot of fucking money out there for discrimination tax. So for every man who treats you bad because you're a woman, every man who every race person comes at you because they don't like your race, that's actually a plus for you because your opponent just became stupid. Literally stupid. They're capable of taking losses they can't even imagine, and you can take them to the bank. Okay. But you can't exploit your discrimination tax. That's your money, by the way. So their discrimination is your tax money. You about to get paid. You can't get that money if you get if you lose restraint. You can't negotiate well. If you go into a meeting and your brain goes, "Oh shit, oh shit, I wonder if I did anything wrong. I wonder if they're gonna like me. Oh shit, okay, I'm not I'm not gonna get angry because this shit usually get me angry." 
even though you say you're not going to be angry, if you have framed yourself as being angry, you are no longer qualified to negotiate for whatever you're negotiating for. If you're dealing with a lot of people with multiple backgrounds, let's just say you deal with, let's say you happen to be an Asian woman from Beijing, and you only hire Asian women from Beijing. But within Beijing, Asian women have huge variations and huge difference in beliefs. And when you hire those individuals, now you have 40 people in a room that work for you with 40 different ways of looking at the world. If you don't have self-restraint, you can't control your team. In the hood, we celebrate that shit. We taught our kids that when we spanked them every day. That shit right there makes you a slave or a servant even if you're the master. You will always lose with that shit right there. It's okay to feel that punch in your chest. Y'all know what I'm talking about when somebody says that right thing at the right time to get to you. I now I will say to you that social justice have made that pain amplify bigger than it really needs to amplify. So if I said to you, hey, young man, uh, look, look, that's, boy, that's a nice hat you have on. No, young, no I'm going to say, uh, hey, guy, that's a nice hat you have on there. Can I just touch that hat? Oh, 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 my God. Oh, oh, you wouldn't ask another white man, could you touch his hat? Especially if it said Naga on the top. Oh, 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 oh. Right? You sensitive fuck. That's cool if you don't want nothing. If you just want to go home and pet your cat every night. And sleep alone, that's cool. Fuck it, be sensitive as you want. How about your cat? Hopefully your cat can get through this. But what I'm telling you, when you start engaging other people and you're playing this game of status, position, resources, driving ideas, competing with other ideas, um, dancing with competition, not fight up, but dancing with competition, um, innovating, convincing, moving, navigating, bringing in large groups of people to buy into a certain core idea, losing restraint compromises that whole fucking dance. And so the reason you have to ride, look, stop outsourcing your security, your value, and there's one more. Security, your acceptance, Mm, it's one more. It's one more. It's going to come back to me. Oh, yes. It's a security acceptance. Oh, yeah. So security, security acceptance. I think it might be value. I, I, I remember security acceptance. There's one more. It'll come back to me. You have to stop outsourcing that. Meaning that somebody else can take and give away your security. Someone can take away and give you value. Someone can take away and give you a set. Let's, let's one more. So come back to me in a minute. But by you outsourcing, what I mean by outsourcing is that if Goose says to me, um, excuse the language, and forgive me for this language, and those who have kids, put your hands over their ears. There's certain things I call cursive. If Goose says, what's up, my nigga? I don't believe in that word. That's not my language. But it also doesn't move me off my foundation. Because why? He doesn't own my value. I own my value. When you over here worrying about the, the, the right, did he say his, her, him, she, her, what, what, shiro, hero? What did he just say? I don't feel like he's, he's speaking to me. Okay, softy, come here. Don't let me control your fucking value. Control your own fucking value. Never outsource your value to me. When you outsource your value, then you, get, you, lose, you lose the ability to restrain yourself. Now you join all these mad-ass motherfuckers on Facebook who are really suffering. And you think y'all free. Y'all think y'all happy, but y'all imprisoned by y'all motherfucking anger. Let that shit go. You have no idea how much your brain, your brain at the end of the day is trying to survive. So your brain says, I need security to survive. I need to be accepted 
to survive. And you don't have value to survive. And what you have a tendency to do is allow somebody from the outside to say, well, when I get this car, I have value. If I marry this person, I have security. Um, women, black women, y'all, oh my God, let me, let me just, let me swing, because I grew up, you know, y'all hit 35, and y'all still saying, I'm nobody if I'm not married. What? I'm not, so, I've seen women, y'all hit 35, and a lot of y'all say, I'm not somebody unless I'm married. Or I'm not happy until I get this married car house. You outsourcing your fucking happiness. If you learn to love yourself first, you'll be surprised how much is at your touch and you within your reach. But it starts with you don't change the people around you. You don't like, let me tell you something about yourself. Let me fix you. Let me fix you. You don't need to fix a motherfucker besides yourself. There ain't nobody to talk to besides yourself. Hey, and you can't. You, the thing is, this is some, some of the things you can't run from. So we talked, some we talked a few times back about how your personality, there may be some things you need to offset or manage or things of that nature to help you continue to move forward. You, forward, you can't move forward without addressing this. You can't run from it because, because a lot of times if you're like, okay, well, I need to leave the room because I'm about to go off on this motherfucker or I'm scared or he just pissed me off or now my energy shifted and it's different and my only recourse is to lead a room, you just killed your, you killed your business off. You can't leave the room in business because you are the boss. You're the leader. You're, it's your business. So who else is going to negotiate for you or who, who else is going to show up for you? So th you have to face this head on and you have to take it in baby steps because the pain's going to start wide. Whatever your propensity is, if it's to, for, fight, for flight or fight or freeze, whatever, which, which, whatever F it is, that pain's going to hit you. And then, see why this boxer, he says, relax, because at that moment, you got to start getting reps in to learn how to be in that moment, learn how to be comfortable in that uncomfortable situation so that you can start mm -hmm. seeping yourself through mm -hmm. and managing the situation. You can't, can't get to a level where he's at, where, where you can start taxing motherfuckers for that discrimination if you aren't calm. If you aren't in a place of peace, if you're not observing, because in those moments where your ego jumps out, your IQ dips. Oh, my God. And you're fucking pissed. I'm, you're nervous. You're scared. You're upset. You're worried. All those emotions just hijack your bandwidth, and now your IQ's dipped. There's three things that you... I have three things. Approval, control, and security. Quite often, you're looking for security, ultimately. Looking for approval, because approval is part of your survival. And then when you don't feel like you can get approval and security, you, you try to control. Those are the three. When a human being, when a human being say they want something, it usually one of those. It falls back on one of those three. But what happens is that when you don't realize that approval, control, and security is something that you have to own internal, not external, you could be hijacked by all three of those. We outsource our power by giving away approval, control, and security. Those are some, so, for example, security might be, I got to have this kind of job. I got to get married. I got to have this kind of, okay, security is to the side. Or control, you know, my kid, I just want to, uh, he just won't get bees. But why are you trying to control him? Because ultimately you want your child to have security. Quite often, you buy certain clothes and shoes and, and cars and houses and try to run certain kind of business and talk about who you are because you're looking for approval. These are three wants. But those three wants you give to other people. And this is what God, this social, and social justice is telling you, these people should respect that, that you gave that to. No, you shouldn't be giving it to them at all. Nobody should be able to improve you. If you're looking for control, control yourself. Plus, you don't really control anything if you want to be honest with it. Learn that you don't really control anything. And security, develop self-security. Nothing going to make you secure. You get married, the mother got to die at some point. They can't stay away because you're just around. What's fuck wrong with you? Would you bury me? I'm hella stanky. Like, literally, like, <laughs> let shit go. Like, you don't own shit like that. Like, that's why, the, look, the reason y'all, the reason y'all break up and hurt so bad is because when y'all break up, y'all thought y'all controlled that shit and that person gave you security. And when that person left you, and sometimes also approval, 
But when that person leaves you, you think, oh, my God, how could they have left me? No, hold on. You, how long did you have them for? You had them for, for four years? Was it good for you? Was, was most of the time good? Okay, you enjoyed it, right? Okay, now move on to the next four fucking years. Because guess what? You don't own nothing in this world. You got to go too. Once you accept your mortality, once you realize you're going to die, then every experience you get, thank God for it and ride on to the next one. Every great moment you have with people is a gift from God. And then that allows every day to flow almost organically. But if you hold on somebody like, you're my only security, you're choking the only relationship you have, the jealousy, the where were you, what do you mean? We, how come, what you, when you said hi, how come you didn't say hi? What does that mean? You, know, you didn't kiss me the right way, like the way you usually kiss. Look, motherfucker, I yeah, can't get that get to you. Phone, if you don't get on my phone, <laughs> you can't get that to you, you. If you don't stop looking down at my phone when I unlock it. Could you, I can't get that to you. My, my mentor told me, first of all, my mentor told me two things. Was hella fun. I didn't understand when I was younger because I didn't have that mindset. My mentor, first thing my mentor was like, I was like, yo, you know, uh, he had a bad second woman. And I used to hang out with him and his wife and the second woman all the time. So I said, yo, man, you ever worry about your wife leaving you? He says, no. Because if she's leaving me, that's what she's meant to be. I said, what happened? You walk in the house with another man. She goes, that's the man she's supposed to be with. I'm out. And I was like, and let me say something about men and women. Men don't see themselves equal to women when it comes to dating. We just don't. So if a man mess around, we go, huh? But if a man and woman mess around, men don't process it the same. I'm just y'all know. Oh, my God. Yeah, men just oh don't process it. Oh, my pre- God. But my mentor said to me, huh? So then my mentor wife dies. Now, mind you, he, was re- he loved his wife. He loved the shit out of his wife. <coughs> so his wife dies. So Because when I call him, I call him, I didn't see him like, Five, six years. I'm like, yo, man, I'm coming by the house. Your wife's still making them, them um, pumpkin cupcakes. It was the best. I've never had a cupcake made out of pumpkins that tastes this motherfucking good in my human life. And any of you guys remember my birthday, September 28th, if you want to send me a pumpkin cupcake, it's really good. Just send, send it to the Fight TV. Media. Anyway, point is this. I stay focused, y'all, because, mm-hmm. you know, that's my own advertisement. But anyway, I called him. I said, hey, man, I'm coming over to the house. He says, oh, Yolanda died. Oh, shit, dog, man. Fuck, I don't know what to say. He said, what do you mean what to say? I had her for 40 years. That was great. He had us a different mindset than us. That's the man who taught me every, that To this day, I still go back to him like, hey, guru, <laughs> what do you think I need to work on next, right? That's how much I look up to this man. It's his, how he moves. He has a subdued ego that he realizes that, I'm not here forever. So stop telling me these stories like I control you. You're my security. You got to prove me for everything. No, you got to own that and then we can have a happy relationship. Go ahead, next one. Keep going. You cannot, as John Steinbeck. You cannot, as John Steinbeck once wrote to to his editor, lose temper as a refuge from despair. Your ego will do you no favors here, whether you're struggling with a publisher, with critics, with enemies, or a capricious boss. It doesn't matter that they don't understand or that you know better. It's too early for that. It's too soon. So a lot of times, if you ever see somebody get really angry, here's a phrase you're going to hear. See, what, what you're doing to me? You don't respect who I am. You, ego, 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 ego. When you get angry, watch how the ego just start talking. I, 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 me, I, you gonna disrespect me, I, I, you try to take from my kids, e, I, e, I, e, I, ego. <laughs> it never says, hey, how could you show up like that without even processing in that? Is there any data you, I can share with you to help you gain insight? You ugly motherfucker. Like, we don't do that, right? It's, it's, it's I, 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 I protect myself. And even if you don't use those words, your brain loses the ability to see any other strategy. Your ego will cloud your brain with, you are being disrespected. Oh, my God. And here's the cold part. When you think about yourself, you only can see one or two strategies. You can't see all the thousands of possibilities. It would only feel like, well, how can he think of anything else? There's only one or two choices he could have made. It's because your ego's talking right now. But when your ego calm your ego down, you, you'll realize there's actually hundreds of choices this person could have made. And also this, the set point of your emotions are never accurate in any situation. So if you remember that, if you if you embed that in your memory, then when the emotions happen and the trigger happens, that's that voice to say, you know, none of this is accurate, right? 
this is all just trigger and response that's in response to some trauma that I happened, had when I was a kid. But this ain't, none of this is accurate because everything, every emotion you feel in those moments, there's a reassurance that's going to happen that's going to tell you you're justified. Something's going to tell you you're justified. You're angry because. I'm mad because. I'm this because. But if there's an emotion that's attached to it, it's never accurate. So then, if you if you never think, if you think to yourself, okay, I know this is this is bullshit. This is an illusion in terms of how I feel because I feel something. If you can take that deep breath and step back and analyze the situation from from that perspective, it's going to help you stay sit in that space because the goal is for you to sit in the space. All right. Hmm, I'm not comfortable right now, and I feel like smacking the shit out this motherfucker. However, I know that 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 emotion is not accurate. So let me ask some questions. Let me dig deeper. Let me figure. Let me find out what my angles are. And now it becomes a it becomes a game. These people we talk. I talked about this before. No matter how fucking talented you are. My illustration is in basketball, but in any arena that you engage in, if you're highlighted to be that kind of human, then there's somebody that's going to manipulate you at some point across from you. That's your competitor or an ally or an enemy somewhere, and they're going to use it when it's, when it's convenient they gonna for them. They're going to tear you apart. So in hoop, oh my God. It's, it's the DeMarcus Cousins syndrome, right? Like DeMarcus Cousins is... Physically and talent-wise, one of the greatest players who ever touched the basketball. But why isn't he um, at the level of LeBron or whatever? Because he can always be touched emotionally. Hey, he's killing right now. Go elbow him in the stomach two times. Tech, second tech, because he mad at the ref, you out of here. Easy. Yep. If, but in business, you can be the same way. Because if you are hella sensitive to social justice shit and you call yourself a boss or a leader or a radical responsibility entrepreneur, then somebody's going to test that shit. And, and trust me, they will paint you as an angry black man, black woman, angry Latino woman, angry Latino man, angry, well, angry Asian, I'm not sure I've ever heard that one. But the point is this, angry, right? And before you know it, they will dismiss you. And then you could be saying the most brilliant shit in the world, no one hears you say, but I promise you won't even get there. You won't even get to the brilliant shit. I know it's not. When you listen to the markets, what, if you get a chance to watch people who are known for their ego, watch when they make their logical argument. The hole is so big, it's ridiculous. But in their brain, they probably can see the hole if they weren't angry. They can see the same hole you can see, but they can't see it. That, in their brain, it seems seamless. It seems so solid that there's no other logical thing that ever makes sense. And you even see, you even see it in the hood, if you get into a circle of people who are complaining about shit, they can, they can argue some shit down to a point that it seems that there's no other, and if you try to bring in some other today, oh, here come that overthinking motherfucker. Going well, back to what we were saying over here, mm. right? Because they're in emotional yeah, space. Yeah. I want to feel, I want to feel. Yeah, I want to feel, feel, right. right. I want to think, I want all that feeling shit. Now, y'all, y'all, y'all that philosophical shit. You gotta say that, you, you go write a book or some shit. But anyway, what we talking about over here, right? And so the reality is that that emotional, look, man, let me say this too. Let me, let me make it less hostile. Stay with me, everybody. When you knew in a system of climbing, a lot of shit going to irritate you because you don't understand. You don't see their motivators. You just see your motivator because you're coming from the bottom and they're trying to protect. So it's going to come off as discrimination, dismissive, devaluing, fucked up. They don't see you. Oh, that's gonna be that's gonna be part of it. That is the natural friction of climbing. It's not a it's not bad people. It's if you come to me real quick, it's like, no, no, I got this idea. And I already told you guys I don't even hear certain ideas. And then I go, okay. And then you see me walk in the room, oh, he's an asshole. You won't see, no, you were weak. And if you don't know how to sit with that space and process that space, because you go into you become unrestrained. You're missing all these opportunities to learn and grow because you're dismissing them because you felt you were devalued in those moments. Yo, I'm, I'm, I'm going through some negotiations right now. And last week I came, I damn near hugged this dude, right? Because I realized this whole negotiation piece came from what I learned here. And that ego is the enemy because I didn't have that in my toolbox. I didn't have it. I didn't have it. I didn't have it. I didn't have it. 
I, I, I gained it here and I practiced it here from these, this fucking material. And so in this negotiation, it's, it was new because it was, I'm across from somebody who made it clear that they were my enemy. Clear. Like, fuck you, Courtney. I don't give a fuck about you. I don't like you. I'm going to make your world hell type of negotiation. And so I have one speed. Well, then what's up then? Let's go outside then. Like, I'll beat your ass then. <laughs> fuck you, motherfucker. What's up then? <laughs> That's it. it. It's either the super nice Courtney or that. But I don't... But, that's not a usable tool in this space. So then what I used to do was just dip. Let me leave because before I do something, let me leave. But that's, that's weak. But the, 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 the years of being here, I realized, wait a minute. I got, wait a minute, I got, wait, hold on, let me ask you a question. I don't, and, and next to you know, we two hours into the conversation. This motherfucker, he gave me an astrical, astronomical number because he like, basically, I hate you and I don't want you. Astronomical. And in an hour, it went down, it went down by half. And then the next morning, it went down by half again. And then the next day, it went down by half again. And then I said, you know what? Thanks, but I don't want it. <laughs> I'm good. But, but it's like, damn, like, like any any of those moments when motherfuckers saying slick shit and the ego jumps up, you like mm, no uh uh-uh. uh stay down there we good watched it just keep keep listening because now you can find holes like he's this is such a prophetic class yo like because if you stay calm and you listen when someone is emotional and 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 prejudge you or discriminates against you, and they get stupid in that point, they get caught in their own cognitive dissonance, and they, forg- they, they devalue you as a human, and they overinflate their intelligence. So all you do, if you stay in the space, you just sit back and listen, and you find the holes. Oh, shit, he has no real play. And I, he don't even see the plays that I have. I'm not even going to say nothing. Continue. And you'll realize that your game is going to step up so strong and, and, and you don't need those tools. You, you don't even think about violence or slapping the shit out of somebody because that becomes so low level and so primitive. That's some basic ass shit. I, it's way more funner to beat the shit out of you mentally now. But like that, I didn't have it. So learn it like that. This is what's going to make you way more powerful in the future because they're expecting if, if you are of color black folks latina they are expecting you to do that shit that's already pre-written in their psychology of the next logical step when they when they press your button <clears throat> listen when you get to a big set of, mo- set of money and they bring lawyers into the room lawyers are playing psychological games and they're playing negotiation games i was listening to the lawyer who defended michael jo- michael jackson and remember this, the last video that came out that incriminated Michael Jackson about, oh, the guy said, well, I actually testified they didn't molest me, but he actually did molest me, and he did, he did all that stuff, right? Well, they didn't realize, no. That, so when Michael Jackson was being interviewed, he did this smart thing where he had another cameraman come in, his own cameraman, and just record the same thing the other guy was recording. So if you watched his version, and you watched the other guy's version, the other guy literally edited what the story he wanted to tell as opposed to you watch the other guy's version, and it's not. So at some point, the, the, the defense decided they wanted to show the, the jury the version that was uh, edited by the guy who was accusing Michael Jackson of molesting these kids. By the way, Michael Jackson's bed that everybody slept in is the size of his room. So people sleep in his bed, but it was like a Disney bed where you can sleep over there, and we're not even close to each other, right? So families would sleep in the same bed because it's the size of his fucking room. I mean, this is no exaggeration. So, so yeah, kids slept in his room, but he also had testimonies of how many families said, yeah, we, the whole family slept in the room because the room is hella big. It ain't like a bed like you, we all sleep in our houses, right? <laughs> so anyway, so the judge, the lawyer said, they, the, the, the defense started arguing that they wanted to show this video that was edited. He goes, and I argued with them, even though we already knew that 
if they showed it, we could beat them because we already had the case. But we had to argue with them so we could just kind of bait them in. And he let them argue, and he, let, he baited them through arguing, got them to show the video, and when they showed the video, they were able to smash them to show how the director had a, a personal vendetta. And so when he came to Michael Jackson, it, he had something like 14 different accounts that was going against him of different stuff. Come to find out, the judge said, if they just find one, Michael was going to go to jail. And they had to say not guilty to all 14. The, the, the jury said not guilty to all 14. My point is this. When you get to bigger levels of negotiation and people's incentives and motivations, this game gets really weird the higher you climb. It's no place for a person that doesn't have self-restraint. Next one. Restrain yourself. I have observed that those who accomplish the greatest results are those who keep under the body, are those who never grow excited or lose self-control, but are always calm, self-possessed, patient, and polite. If you, if, if you go watch that lawyer, I can, I'm going to try to find his name and put those posts in the group. The lawyer that's speaking, when he talks, he displays this. Like even when he, like he, went, he went up against, I think Suge Knight fired him. And Suge Knight and him had this really tense beef. He spoke so nicely about Suge Knight. Hey, you know, he's a very intelligent man. He fired me, but I can't disclose why. But at the end of the day, um, I really like Suge Knight. I think he's very intelligent. It's just unfortunate that this happened to him. And as far as his case, I, I think because he's black, he probably got more time than he deserved because it was self-defense. However, because of his reputation and him being black, I think he, he had the worst part. But if you watch him talk about his enemies... You would think he loved his enemies. But the man was so composed and he was so, his emotions, like he didn't see good and bad. He just saw situations. Now, a lot of, a lot of us will grow up, especially if we grew up in the hood or we grew up maybe learning how to defend ourselves at a certain points in our lives, at school, from bullies, I know, you know, and once you hit that threshold of like, I'm fighting and I ain't, it's on, like, then you just stick with that mentality. Moving into this space, some, some, some of us, a portion of us will say that's being weak. This is being weak. You're not, like, you got to say what's on your mind. You got to keep it 100 with people. You got to, like, what the fuck, like, get in their face, like, how, say how you feel. But this is not getting weak. Actually, it's the opposite. It's making you more powerful. Because if you already got that in your bag at any moment of time, you really you with the shit in that regard, but you add that to your bag, now it makes you more powerful. Because you don't got to use it. You, use, you can use this. And if you restrain yourself, you observe, you learn more. Some of the, some of the biggest gangsters that I know are like this. You don't know how they coming. I don't want you to know how I'm coming. Like, like, because if you know how I'm coming, then you can strategize accordingly. But if you don't, if you're like, yeah, shit, it's okay, shit, night, you, you know, it's all right. He fired me. Um, but I wish him well. Then it's a confused, you're in a confused state. Well, then, okay, I'm cool. A lot of times motherfuckers relax. Um, that, there, there was a, um, in, in the Vietnam War, with the with the Vietnamese soldiers would do with the U.S. Army, where they go, they be all sleeping at night. They go or surround them and bang a whole bunch of things around them while the U.S. soldiers would sleep. And the U.S. soldiers would scramble, get up, grab their guns, and oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. But the Vietnamese soldiers wouldn't do anything. The next day, they do it again. Scram, bang, 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 and all the soldiers would get up. <laughs> Put their shit on, get ready to fight, and Vietnamese soldiers would disappear, and nothing happened. So then the third time they did it, bang, 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 the U.S. soldiers just stayed asleep. I'm like, oh, that's some bullshit. And that's when the U.S. soldiers wiped out that whole platoon. I mean, the Vietnamese wiped out that whole platoon. Because once you fall into the expectations of your enemies, once your enemies uh, create a certain perception of you, or your behavior, or your emotions, and it and you don't show your hand, they're vulnerable. And, and so in this particular regard, not just dealing with enemies, but with anybody, you got to hold your composure. You got to keep your cards in. 
and let me say this too. Uh, like when you practice this, it gives you the ability to develop multiple eyes when everybody's got limited vision. See, when you get emotional and your ego strong, your vision is narrow. So you only can see so much. The more you calm yourself down, you can see more happening. You can also see the person in front of you better. It's like you can, you can watch a person, what they call tilt. You can watch all these type of things where people start to show their cars or their, their, they start to show themselves or display themselves when you calm. But when you're not calm and you match my anger, you're blinded by my You won't even see I'm lying to you because you're so mad. Or you won't even see nothing. You won't even see a strategy. You won't see your play. Like there's sometimes you can take a loss, which is a win. But, you, but if you're always making sure you never take a loss, you never get those wins. Some wins require you to step back to move forward. But if you're always moving forward, that limits how far, how fast you can move forward. And so playing this game is not one-dimensional. And, un, and being unrestrained makes you extremely one-dimensional. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're so, it's like, you know, I, used to, I remember a long time ago they said, um, when you study, like, pay attention to fighters. And when you see a real dude that's real buff, a little dude, if he understands fighting, gets happy. Because a buff dude is one-dimensional because why? He has to move so much muscle to hit you that if he doesn't take you down right away, he's done. He's vulnerable. Right? So all a little dude has to do is stay and move because you're one-dimensional. Now, if a little dude fights another small dude, he don't know where to deal, deal with that. Because small people can be strong, and small people don't may have less muscle mass, and, and so you don't know. It's just it's much more complex. But a big old ah, oh, I've known to knock a dude out like like um, that famous dude was a boxer on the streets so who was knocking cats out, right? Kimbo, Kimbo, Kimbo yeah, slash. he didn't last long. You're one dimensional. Even uh, the, the 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 Irish cat from um, Conor, Conor McGregor, I got I got good punching power, but I ain't got no good. I can't grapple. I can't. I'm not great at kicking. I don't. You one dimensional. So it can, it, can, it can give you a false sense of value and progress, but this game is so complex that you're about to get into. Imagine if everybody you fought had multiple talents and multiple skills, you had different expertise, but they're coming at you every day from different angles. You can't afford that your only move you got is knock a, knock a muffle in his mouth. Mm -mm. That's just not gonna translate. This is our last one for the night, then we'll go home. Next week, I think we're gonna start with Eagles of Enemy and goes hard to paint. That's a beautiful girl that you used. That's a beautiful black woman. Go ahead. Absolutely. Our own path, whatever we aspire to, will in some ways be defined by the amount of nonsense we are willing to deal with. Our humiliations will pale in comparison to Robinson's, but it will still be hard. It will still be tough to keep our self control. So, in the beginning stages, it's tough. As you evolve, it gets easier. Never go, the pain never goes away. The first part says, our own path, whatever we aspire to, will in some ways be defined by the amount of nonsense we are willing to deal with. When you build a business, you're going to deal with a lot of nonsense. Anything great you want to do, you, look, let me tell you how, how people are. People don't see people as heroes. People, let's say you have a company full of employees. You say, you know what, everybody working hard. So you know what, everybody, I'm going to buy y'all snacks. Oh, my God. Damn, no, no, thank you, bro. And then you go, you know what, I'm going to get everybody massages on Friday. Oh, my God. This is one of the best places to work. You know, as a matter of fact, I'm going to make sure that um, I'm going to provide a car for everybody on this staff so you can get back and forth to work. Oh, this is the coolest job. Six months later. Um, how come Marquita is not ordering what I asked her to order? I, I don't understand. I, I know you've got a snack drawer, but some, it's, not, it's not stacked with consistently what I asked for. Uh, you know, the massage lady, can she come in more than Fridays? Because I can't get here on Friday. I need well, about Fridays, Thursdays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays. No, no, that car you gave me, I got a bigger family. Is it possible I can get a Yukon or an Escalade or something like this? I, mean, I just think, I mean, you gave me a four-door car, but, uh, you know, I'm kind of, this is how human beings work. Ask any president. Nonsense. 
So whatever path you take, don't think people are going to emotionally reward you into a space of happiness like your mama did when you was a little kid. Oh, I believe you. Just keep going. Just keep. You're here. Now you're going to celebrate you now. Here. Can you go celebrate you again? Okay. You're so glad to have a child like you. Oh, my God. No, the real world would be like, man, fuck your previous accomplishment. You ain't shit because you did one thing wrong. I don't give a fuck how much blood, sweat, and tears. I don't give a fuck how much you nope. broke on your family. I don't give nope. a fuck because I didn't get my sandwich. Yep. And my sandwich is important. It's important. And I promise you, and you're going to look at them like, and you want to tell this person sitting in front of you who's in charge of engineering, you motherfucker. Yep. And you have to say, well, how can we make you happy? Yep. And smile. And li- here's the thing. And be, be big enough. This is what's important. And this is the most important part. When that conversation is over, to be able to forget about it and have zero impact on your day. Why is that important? Because when it first starts, it's here and there. After a while, you may get 10 or 20 of those a week, 40, 50 of those a yes. week. Yes. And if you don't have the ability to rise above and keep moving and go on that date you plan on going on, go in that restaurant laughing with your friends, going home and playing with your kids with no motherfucking residue. Come on, bro. Tell I them, bro. promise you, Tell them, bro. you cannot get into any form of leadership Tell at all. Because that's what's going to happen. Your ego will destroy you because you will start thinking about what this mean to me. Tell what are you saying them, to me? Oh, my God. This, oh, I'm hurt. Oh, you know, don't talk to me that way because that's how they talk to me at work and blah, blah. You don't shut the fuck up. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm, I'm giving yeah. y'all 100. This shit is so hard because I think many of y'all think that y'all are about to climb this ladder. Y'all don't forget when you climb the ladder, nothing will ever be the same. And for a little while, you're going to sacrifice freedoms for the ultimate freedom. And on that, in that, in that journey, you're going to take, when you take on more responsibility, you're going to take on more emotions in your world. And if you, in this space where it's because the Buffett don't like you, do you realize most of your employees, if you become, look, Jeff Bezos, this motherfucker made his money. Fuck what you heard. Now, I think it was wrong for him to stunt. Right after COVID, I think he should have waited. I think I think he should just did the shit and not did a whole yo. Know, so um, one small step for man, one giant step for Bezos. You understand me, El Rutter? Uh, like mm-hmm. if he would just who the fuck up there came on down and say, hey, by the way, I've been testing this idea and we we think about starting this as a business to a group of people. And then later on, be like, hey, say we in 2025. Things are cool. Everybody financially cool. Be like, hey, you know, back at, when it was COVID happening, I, me and my friends, we started testing this spaceship, I think by him stunting on the show. However, I stopped there. Now, what that man does with his money, I got no beef with that. I got no beef with that. I, have, I may have beef with billionaires and some of their tones and some of this, but I don't have beef with that. Let me tell you why. Because what we forget is the same people he's employing and gave opportunities, it, the same people cussing him out right now. Because when he got 200 billion, they make sure they had 200 million. They don't understand why they only get 100,000. Now, mind you, they may only made 30,000 a year before. This is, I'm talking from, this is personal experience. I paid a motherfucker three times what they ever made in their life, and he looked at me like, uh, where's the rest? Yeah, man. I, I, I'm not, this is no exaggeration. Yeah. You got to get to a point where you realize, oh, this is the game I'm in. Yeah. Oh, okay. Stay calm. Relax. Yeah. Think, process. Yep. Yep. Nobody gives a fuck. So that applies as well to the, the, the level and standards that you set. That's why company culture is important, but understanding that how you show up to your customers, meaning you don't get an opportunity to to be different in how you show up and, and, and expect it to be cool, to be like, oh, you gave me this last time, but now you, you gave me the high-level uh, ketchup package, you gave me the Heinz, and then now I come back and you give me the cheap ketchup. This whole place is fucked up. And you're like, what? Everything is the same except the ketchup package. You, well, shit, if the ketchup package is fucked up, something else must be going on that I don't see that's <laughs> fucked up. But employees the same way. Like, how you show up to your employees and the level and consistency and standards that you show up to, they'll do you the same fucking way. So you gotta, 
you got to make sure that that communication is the same. And your feelings will be hurt sometimes because there's sometimes where I've had my last dollar to make sure that they were paid. And maybe, you know, I gave them my last dollar. And, it, and, they, and it's like, well, you didn't do that, though. How come you didn't do And I'm like, motherfucker, like, you don't realize. I, I, had, to, I had to do the shit they're doing now in East Oakland, like bang some back windows and grab bags to, <laughs> change, to convert this shit into money to pay your ass. And this is how you talking to me? Like, but, but you got to just smile. You got to smile and be like, you know what? You're right. I got you. I got you on the next one, you know? Oh, <laughs> hey, y'all, listen, um, let's be safe. Let's exercise. Next week, we're going to jump heavy, 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 heavy in ego. Uh, we're going to come back to strategy, um, but I think we're going to go ego first and then jump into strategy second. Um, it's going to be a lot of strategy at this point. This is the, this, I'm giving you guys details of how to go about running a business correctly. So we're dealing with st- tactics. But do not think the psychology is the weakest part. It's the most important part. Because everything we teach you tactically, if you're psychologically not understanding the evolution you have to go through, you can't get through the process. Because it's difference between writing up that chart and then going out and doing the work. It's a totally different world. And some of y'all can get stuck on that fucking chart and be bragging and sending people's camera phone shots of your fucking chart Knowing goddamn well when I walk in your business next year, it's the same motherfucking business. So just know it's a combination of so, it's not one thing, two things, or five steps of success. It's a lifestyle. It's a different way of thinking. And so, look, y'all be safe this weekend. We'll see y'all next week. And with that being said, cue it, baby. Hit it. <laughs>